Hi, my name is Bob Greenier and I'm a volunteer with the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project. So welcome to this Sunday day or evening, depending on where you are in the world and possibly morning for those that are in the Antipodean sense. So, hi. Uh, I have something rather special to you. It was sent to me by a member of the Orion team. That is the company now that is taking forward the learning from the Sapphire experiments. And uh, it was sent to me just over a week ago, and I included it in my Taking Flight presentation, which I am editing, and I will probably publish tomorrow evening. And it was just incredible that uh, I had seen something in 2017 in Suhas Raukar's lab, and it gave me huge pause for thought. And as more data came in from more participants and research around the world, it was uh, quite amazing that things were moving in this direction. Uh, one of the most amazing things was the observation on a piece of tungsten with a Mars gas in 2019 in Japan. And really that kind of clinched it for me. Uh, it's quite shocking, but I think what I'm going to share with you tonight is an important part of the story. Because I think what's happening is that whilst there are certain types uh, and people in the uh, militaries and uh, secret services around the world that would rather this doesn't get out and are throwing out uh, various bits of uh, fear, uncertainty and doubt and interference on the subject, it is very clear that exotic vacuum objects is something that other parts of uh, academia are taking very, very seriously, even if they don't recognize that's what they're doing. Uh, they may be doing it in ignorance. I doubt it, though. But uh, anyway, what I am going to show you tonight is absolutely certainly the exotic vacuum object, and you will recognize it. But what it does is it produces some metrics that uh, maybe have only been inferred um, ballparks of. And what am I talking about? Well, we've talked about the fact that these uh, structures could create intense magnetic vortices. And we've talked about half solitons ever since we saw those structures formed on the outside of the Lion reactors. Those ones that were uh, cannons, as I called them, where they were firing material from one side of uh, a oxidized copper wire to the other side, and I'm calling them North and South Poles. And I said that this um, O structure has a diameter, but it has a ring and a spot, and the spot is important, and the ring is important, but that the ring itself, uh, at the time of its actual uh, being functional, actually, in my view, has essentially no dimension. And I think if you've been looking at the uh, reveal of the Matsumoto book, uh, his work from 1989 to 1999 that I have been sharing on remoteview.icu. You will see that he thinks that between the black and the white hole there is a wormhole and that wormhole may be down to 10 to the minus 33 centimeters which uh, puts it very close uh, to the Planck's uh, distance and that for me is about as much as something can have no dimension. So that is, if you can imagine the ring, uh, it has a diameter but the material that's contained within the ring effectively has no dimension. Uh, uh, in fact, it has the basic minimum dimension that you could possibly have. And so one can imagine that um, it, this it, it might be able to transport uh, itself through matter uh, and carry effectively matter through matter without the matter being perceived as being transported through the matter. But when there is an impedance change, when there is a change of um, sort of local space uh, structure, um, you can imagine that these things would be disrupted and then they kind of reveal themselves. So this might be akin to the uh, sort of half soliton you get on a swimming pool. And we've discussed these uh, aspects in great length. But this paper that I'm about to share with you was, as I said, sent to me just over a week ago and uh, very excited by the Orion team. And um, it was uh, published first, uh, I think, uh, and we're going to have a look at it in a second, but it was published first, uh, maybe I don't have it on this one, it was published first on, in public, and I'm looking at the wrong paper, give me a second, on 21st of April 2021. So uh, this is long after... Uh, I decided that I was going to, for instance, uh, put 
the Ra symbol on my uh, wedding ring here and make, to fa make a fractal structure of that. I was that convinced I was willing to put it on my ring. Um, so uh, this is, uh, I believe, what the Egyptians thought uh, the sun used in order to do its work. I believe the Egyptians were right. How they knew that, I don't know. Um, but we can only speculate. And uh, what we're going to... Um, see tonight I think is going to start speaking to the immense pressures in the magnetic vortex that is going on. Now um, uh, let me just uh, talk to you and this is a slide from Taking Flight if I can find it by the way I don't know whether I can find it let me see if I can find it first. Uh, give me a second how is everyone today can you hear me? Uh, if you can hear me so the Taking Flight presentation will be tomorrow and the Q&A will be after that. I have added some extra slides in and where things weren't working on the day. Uh, those are going to be in there as well. Um, uh, but this is a short presentation tonight, but I think the significance cannot be understated. I believe that there are parts of the um, research community around the world that either they've stumbled into it or they've been led into it, but they are taking it very seriously. So I think a number of years ago when a military guy phoned me and said, don't worry, we're not going to kill you because uh, uh, we're investigating this as part of our fusion research. I think they were probably be quite, they're quite, probably quite serious. Um, but I think a lot of this credit has to go to Winston Bostick and to Tesla and to um, uh, Nardi and to John Hutchison and obviously, obviously, Kenneth Radford Shoulders. Okay, so um, let me find... I'm looking for here. Okay. So. Mm -hmm. So as we uh, look at this data, I want you to consider what I'm showing you here. And this is some magnetic field strengths. So if you've got depolarization of it in your new neuron in your brain, that is 0.5 picoteslas. So uh, that goes to show how you can depolarize a brain with a very, 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 very small magnetic field. Earth's magnetic field is uh, 0.5 uh, Gauss, uh, that's 50 microteslas, uh, refrigerator magnet, 5 milliteslas, junkyard electromagnet. This is the sort of thing that you might be lifting a car up at your junkyard. I can imagine John moving some of his equipment around using a junkyard electromagnet, and uh, that is one tesla. Now, if you've had an MRI like I, I uh, had uh, last year, um, that is a 0.5 to 3 Teslas. And they would say, oh, you need to uh, take off everything that's metal on your body and put that uh, away, otherwise it's going to cause a problem for the device. And that is only up to 3 Teslas. Now, a research MRI scanner uh, is 7 to 11.7 .7 Teslas. Now, that's an interesting number because if you remember the recent MIT announcement about this new superconducting uh, magnet that they had created, which would bring forth for fusion, that's hot fusion or whatever they call it these days, um, uh, much, much quicker by having this 10 Tesla uh, superconducting magnet. Well, that is the kind of field strength that the MIT was announcing then. Now, you can get laboratory NMR spectrometers. These are things that might be used uh, by um, Reutzkeff when he was determining that the iron 57 had had variously a north and south magnetic monopole charge added to them from his exploding foils in the early 2000s this would be 6 to 23 teslas now the largest pulsed field ever created in the lab uh, non-destructively that is a pulse of a magnetic field that didn't destroy the equipment was 97 teslas and the largest pulse field created in the lab ever uh, according to this source here destroying equipment but but uh, not the lab, fortunately, uh, was 730 Teslas. Now, let's bear that in mind as we move forward with this discussion. So, right, okay, so, uh, blah, 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 blah. Okay. Okay, excellent. All right, so, um, so the, the paper is, and I'm going to see if I can actually copy a link to the paper that some of you may or may not be able to download, uh, given the fact uh, that some, in some regions they don't allow sci-hubs. I'm hoping that some of you can download this so you can follow along 
Um, let me just see if I can get the link here for you. Um, and I will copy it into the chat. Uh, ba -ba -ba -ba. Okay, so here it is. Uh, copy, I'm going to paste this into the chat. So hopefully you guys that are able to access Sci-Hub, but maybe you can do it if you have a uh, a VPN. So there, there is a link to a copy of the paper online, and it was published in um, Plas Physics of Plasmas. Um, and before I go there, I'm going to give the introduction slide here, because this is going to be relevant to the Magnetic Vice presentation slash uh, presentation that I gave for the um, taking flight. So it's here. And I've talked about this a number of times in the past. Uh, and I'm going to change, hold on, let me just change my mouse pointer so that I'm, when I'm wiggling the mouse around, you can actually see what I'm talking about. Um, and what did I do there? I didn't do something I wanted to do. Give me a second. <laughs> Go and have a look at the... Uh, um, the the uh, presentation there, um, the PDF. Okay, so what I want to do is that, and I want to go blah 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 over here. Um, now I've forgotten what I was doing. Okay, uh, I completely lost it. Right. Okay, so I, I was talking about uh, this uh, shock or resonance, and this was a video I shared in uh, 2013 on the 20th of May 2013. And uh, there was two options that I believed that you could achieve creating the active agents in Lena. And one was to shock it, and the other one was to uh, apply resonance to it. So with this um, uh, Tibetan singing bowl, you can either bang it and it, it uh, finds its resonant frequency and sings it back to you, or you can run the gamel around the outside, this wooden block, sometimes with a piece of suede on there, and it will get it to resonate. And obviously, one might argue that doing uh, resonant stimulation of a system to make it work at its resonant frequency uh, is the best approach to efficiency, and I would agree. So this is ideally what we would do, but you might be able to find out what the resonant frequency is by giving it a good old whack. And uh, so one can lead to the learning that uh, gives you the answer that you need to do the uh, resonant stimulation. So we're going to put that aside. Okay. Okay. Right. And I think there was another slide in here. Uh, da -da -da. And obviously, um, we have talked about this structure here and the fact that uh, it was derived from a whole bunch of um, observations on the Hutchison fracture sample, MFMP fracture sample, and that each one is like a fractal um, sort of substructure of the overall structure. So you have these little substructures which are D4D and then they join together into a ring which is D4D and then they join it in together uh, with a ring which is D4D and um, subsequent to publishing this I for the first time was told sometime later by Josh Hennan that um, John Archibald Wheeler who worked on the physics of the H-bomb and the H-bomb and uh, physics follow following that uh, came up with this thing called a, a gion and that he believed that these worked at various scales and that there were strong electro electric fields and magnetic fields alternately in these self-organized structures and that through the center there was a gravitational azimuth um, that goes together. So the question is, uh, do these bind together into self-similar fractal structures gravitationally or do they bind together in a um, sort of electromagnetic way. Uh, it would imply here that they do bind together sort of electromagnetically in, in, a, in a way, but they have a, a gravitational thing through the azimuth. Okay, so uh, that aside, 
Um, and and then uh, this is from a previous presentation where uh, earlier this year someone thought they'd invented something interesting by getting a load of uh, um, uh, uh, transition uh, atomic. So this is basically a, a little, um, basically an Evo, but they, they'd got this into a single quantum object, Bose-Einstein condensate, and they were all very impressed with themselves. But of course, uh, um, in the field of Evos, we've been doing this for a very long time. But anyway, it's nice to see um, mainstream science doing this and uh, we talked about how you can get these structures here um, that are surviving for days and uh, one person reported to me they could make them last four months and still be visible and glowing these are solitons moving around and that these clustered together into a crystal and prior to this work being shared by the Moscow uh, Engineering Physics Institute National Research Nuclear University uh, this structure here we had seen something similar here uh, being picked out by an observer uh, a year or two before from a water arc discharge in a spark and that these overall structures that here look quite similar to uh, these structures observed by us on the vibrator plates of Matsumoto and that uh, these meshes were observed in 1993 in the cold fusion experiments of, of Matsumoto and that I believe that they are similar. Now what I'm saying that I think these probably are are a bunch of these type of structures which are flexible. We already, already determined they had to be flexible with their field compression strengths because the inside and the outside um, could it's a little bit more compressed on the inside than the outside so there is a sort of compression as it comes round uh, and it, it forms a stable self-organizing structure and that will be happening with uh, uh, Wheeler's guions and it will be happening obviously here there will be needing to be some compression so um, I am saying that when they get bigger, these things, and they get a little bit more sloppy, they think they can then potentially merge together into these kind of structures, um, which then perform, form a mesh over an entire structure. And uh, we have observed those kind of things. And for those that don't know, um, the original structure uh, for um, this was determined by these series of examinations of the uh, fracture sample. And uh, we have uh, these images here for, uh, well, we have this one for the, the this is the outy and the inny is the, the, the inny the is the ying, the outy is the yang, the yang, yang is making things come apart and this is putting them back together again. And there will be a flux loop between these two structures. And this is the 100 micron diameter structure. And then we have the, uh, 100 micron structure here as a substructure here on a 800 micron structure so that's the d4d structure and then we have the uh, eight uh, the 400 micron structure here on a 1600 micron structure here which we can see from the top and there's an animated one here um, here you can see the animated one as I'm putting the light around and you can see the grooves here and it was from these grooves that I calculated that there is uh, 48 segments around the loop and there is the divots and the gaps and the divots and the gaps and this is you know I came up with that red structure and this is D4D and these this is work published by Nardi I think and and uh, Bostic in the 1970s I think um, at the tail end of their work and you can see the dark and white and dark and white and dark and white and dark and white areas around here and down the bottom here it says note hole formed by pinched electrons by pinched electrons exactly as I'm describing it it must be pinched it looks pinched in fact if you look in here we worked out that it was it was a it was a smaller groove in the middle and it was an expanding groove as it came out so those are the pinched electrons you can see the sort of triangular structure of that black area there uh, pinched electrons at the center of a large d4d ratio ring with spokes under the surface so uh, there we go and we've got them up here as well. So um, this this is uh, what was called a condensed plasmoid by Bostic and Nardi, and uh, what we call um, uh, exotic vacuum objects. And he said that basically, perhaps the study of the forms assumed by this putty, this self self shaping putty here. Um, may help us understand configurations such as the stars and galaxies. It may also throw light and other at the other end of the 
uh, scale on the construction of fundamental particles such as the electron, the proton, mesons and neutrinos. They too may be made of a self-organizing putty, a putty composed of electromagnetic field and its own gravitational forces which working together create the bodies we know as particles. So here we go and this is published in uh, 1957. 1957. The Wheeler paper here was published in, um, where is it, if I can find it, uh, the Wheeler paper here on Gions, which has electro and magnetic alternating field structures with the gravity through. This is published uh, or submitted in 1954. You can see some fever pitch going on. And the mesh-like structure covering the whole surface uh, is here, and I shared these images. These are the same scale taken with the same microscope. This is on the quartz from the Lion reactor, and for whatever reason, it did allow X-rays to go through uh, and beta particles and that's how this clear fused quartz ended up pink along with the heat and this is a known heat treatment method for um, uh, making coloured so-called gems out of quartz crystals. Um, you, are, you are emitting either beta particles or, or radiation and so we know that these uh, exotic vacuum objects are, are point sources of x-rays and beta particles so it fits the bill and this is the edge of this so it's kind of like this edge here um, and you can see uh, this is the hard edge and it has these yin yangs over it has the yin yangs all over again this Hutchison fracture sample and it forms a mesh over the surface and this is recorded under the faux dragon um, outside of this center um, temple in the um, in the uh, Forbidden Palace in Beijing, which I had the pleasure to touch this actual object fortuitously uh, when I was 18, which was 31 years ago now. Uh, so uh, this stuck in my head from that time. So this is the overall mesh, and this is a projection, if you like, of the flower of life on the Temple of Osiris uh, in Egypt. And uh, so this is a 2D, supposedly laser cut. They don't know how it happened. Uh, this is how it would go on a plane. This is how it would go on a sphere. And in my view, and I've said this since my Sochi presentation, I believe that this is the mesh-like structure that forms the structure that encapsulates ball lightning. And I believe that we are seeing something akin to that in the structure that is on this quartz and protected this from the otherwise damage that happened exactly immediately adjacently to it with the heater on the outside and the uh, low energy nuclear reaction source going on in the center so it's between that but for some reason this bit is coated with this mesh which is effectively like a force shield uh, yes it is allowing some beta particles to get through uh, and you've just got damage on this uh, surface here um, but otherwise the inside of that is much less damaged than this material and the uh, aluminium here on the um, sample from John Hutchison. So um, that is uh, how I see these uh, things joining together and forming meshes uh, and then there is the question of how uh, can the um, the exotic vacuum objects bore through, in this case, silicon carbide uh, and, in this case, alumina. Now, silicon carbide is a covalent, extremely in, uh, highly uh, tough and high temperature uh, refractory ceramic uh, um, uh, material rather and uh, this is a ceramic alumina here and it's bored through it and, and fluidized the material as it's gone through and as I've said in the past Ken Shoulders found that he could put a paraffin wax which melts uh, something like 55 53 something degrees centigrade you can put that on top and the evo will come through and it will splosh around whatever the material is that it's uh, moved but it won't actually melt the paraffin wax so it isn't a thermal process it's something else that is going on uh, but it's it can't burrow through something that is not conductive the the uh, uh, the alumina can be made conductive um, by the influence of the exotic vacuum object and, and I think that will become clear how. And when you compare this to, for instance, um, what ball lightning does, so this is ball lightning structure um, uh, hole that's come through a wall and you can see the uh, helical structure here with the carbon burn um, that's coming from it. From it. Um, you can see the hexagonal structure here of one that's gone through this piece of concrete and found these pieces of steel reinforcing. Uh, this is ball lightning um, 
consuming uh, a um, piece of wall and if we look at the comparison between the helical type of, type of splashing going on around this and, and the same kind of thing on this ball lightning they're very very different scales but I believe it's the same kind of thing so this would be an exotic vacuum object alone or it would be a micro ball lightning structure and here it is and uh, we've talked about here in the magnetic fluid that is produced in the Vega Valley where we have uh, these uh, the anode up here, the cathode down here, which is uh, pieces of brass, two pieces of brass on another much larger piece of brass. And it builds up the electron condensate in these micro in these macro ball lightning structures. And over a hundred hour period, it produced such uh, amounts of, in my view, coherent matter, uh, electron, uh, fluidized electrons that they bled out and they are a highly magnetic structure. So rather than being, um, if I can describe it rather, if I can describe um, a normal ball lightning to be this kind of structure, if you imagine it, if you get two of these next to each other, they will have a surface tension and wet wet together and eventually become like a, a, a pill shaped. And if you had enough of them in a row, row, like I have on the wall behind me from the Vega Valley here, uh, we have one, one at the end here and maybe one over here, they're wetting into each other. And so they, pro they produce a skin uh, which is akin to uh, this uh, structure here um, and that that goes on to uh, produce these channels and because they're intensely magnetic they form the same kind of structure as I've shown you before that ferrofluid forms uh, with these type of pentagonal and hexagonal uh, um, sort of cell units and they are able to pull in material and they, they, they are um, uh, yin and yangs uh, that, that form a regular mesh like a, a a uh, skirmion mesh and I've talked about that in the past so you're getting an overall uh, impression impression of these things and um, so uh, I think I'm probably going to go on to the paper today um, th there's lots I talk about in 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 uh, the magnetic vice presentation which it effectively is uh, the taking flight presentation and I will go and expand on those slides after I've published uh, the um, edited version of that probably tomorrow at the end of the week I'm going to be uh, talking to the Russian community on Wednesday uh, with an extended presentation of the Lena in a can um, so just give me a sec I'm going to pull up that uh, video uh, that presentation now so Uh, before I do that, essentially, um, over the last several years, uh, since I realized that this was probably uh, akin to natural ball lightning and that Ken Shoulders had uh, basically nailed it and that several other authors since then, I realized, had the same uh, realization, um, there has been a concerted effort to try and use fear, uncertainty and doubt and also particularly uh, with uh, one former um, US Naval Labs uh, chief researcher at the re recent uh, ICCF 23 uh, a claim uh, to try and in my view in my view it's either uh, he's misguided uh, but I don't think that's the case uh, to spread what I call interference uh, when saying that EVOs are essentially just a columbic explosion. Well, they can do a columbic explosion, explosion that's true. So um, that is what you would might classically call a limited hangout, but that is not all they can do. Um, it's one thing that is terrifying that they can do, but um, uh, uh, it can be, um, but it's not all they can do. It's not just a columbic explosion. So um, I have to say that you, you have several Several parts in the military and and uh, energy infrastructures in various countries that are briefing against this uh, uh, being coming mainstream. And what you're going to see right now is the fact that there's a whole other area, and these are not by chance. I don't believe this is not by chance. Who are investigating this very, very, very seriously, and uh, we're going to see just how serious that is right now. So what we have here is a paper. Again, it was sent by the team at Orion. So thank you to them. Uh, to Dennis and Michael. Um, so this is dynamics of moving electron vortices and magnetic ring in laser plasma interaction. So uh, here's the authors, uh, 
uh, I'm sorry if I get your name wrong. Um, Zhang is at the end and Yu is at the beginning. I don't know the convention who's the most important. Uh, sometimes it's the person at the end and some person. Some, I think it's the person at the beginning. It's called Yu et al. So uh, Yu. And this is uh, the Laboratory for Laser Plasmas, uh, Ministry of Education, School of Physics and Astronomy at Shanghai Yao Tong University, Shanghai. And then we have Collaborative Innovation Center, Shanghai. We have Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, Berkeley, California. We have the Institute of Physics, uh, ELI Beamlines Project. And this is in Prague in the Czech Republic, right here where I am. The Kansai Photon Institute. Uh, and this is in Japan. The Graduate School for, creation, uh, for the Creation of New Photonics Industries uh, in Japan. Uh, the Department of Physics, University of Strathclyde, Glasgow, United Kingdom. You have uh, the Sung Dao Li Institute, Shanghai. And you have the Institute of Physics, Chinese Academy of Sciences, Beijing. And I believe the software that was used in this simulation in this was pro programmed in Portugal. So this really is an incredibly trans-global um, uh, uh, effort. Now let's have a look at who's funding this uh, operation. Uh, and you, I don't know whether you can see it in this. Can you see it in this? Yes. So the work was partly supported by the National Science and whatever foundation or NSAF of China, the Strategic Priority Research Program of the Chinese Academy of Sciences, the Project High Field Initiative from the European Regional Development Fund. So this is from China Central Funds, from European Central Funds, and the US Department of Energy uh, offices of science offices, uh, simulations. So here we go. What you are seeing here is China, Europe, and the U.S. Department of Energy. This is about as serious as you can possibly imagine. Now, this is actually simulated. Simulations are performed on the Pi supercomputer. Right, so what is the Pi supercomputer at Songjiao University? I don't even know whether this is a big one, so we're going to find out real time whether this is a big supercomputer. So why not? Let's, let's just see what it is that they are using um, for this particular simulation. Okay, so I'm going to do this right now. So Intel has spun out the Omnipath business to Cornelius. La 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 la. Is one of the most prestigious universities in China. University of uh, I don't know. I don't know. Does it does it rank in the top ten? <laughs> it's the Pi new Pi two supercomputer, right? So um, uh, top ten supercomputers. Ah, uh, more items. I don't know. Maybe it doesn't wrap in <laughs> come into the top ten. Anyway, people can. People can find out. Cambridge one. I don't know. I don't know how old this is. Sierra. Anyway, HPC five. I don't know. It doesn't appear to be in the top ten. Anyway, it was out on a supercomputer um, there. So um, I think we can safely say with the European Union, China, and the U.S. Department of Energy funding this, and all of the players involved: UK, Czech Republic, uh, China, Portugal, Japan, U.S. Uh, uh, this is a very very serious thing that they are looking into. And I don't blame them because it's the God's toolbox. <laughs> okay. All right. Let's have a look at what we got here. So moving electron vortices have been observed in laser interaction with non-uniform near critical density plasma by multi-dimensional particle in-cell simulations. <sighs> okay. In two-dimensional geometry, there are two vortices with opposite magnetic polarity. Well, isn't that a thing? Isn't that a thing? Because you know what? That's exactly what was observed in the 1950s and published by one Winston Bostick. You had your um, little sort of hexagonal structure and on the top you had two vortices uh, traveling in the direction of, uh, with a G direction, a gravity direction, and you had the two uh, vortices which were magnetic uh, flux uh, vortices or, or, with the opposite spin on them. Okay, 
Moving perpendicular to the plasma density gradient direction, the field distribution and particle motion composing such moving structure have been clearly observed in simulations, which explains the vortex motion. Wow, this is great because this adds some numbers onto what we have been showing and observing in multiple experiments in physical experiments and that you can replicate, I believe, in ultra experiments. Okay, so two components of the loop currents are formed around each electron vortex which dominate the vortex motion. The moving vo velocity can be as large as 0.2 of the speed of light, 0.2 of the speed of light, forming relativistic vortices inside the plasma. Laser plasma conditions such as intensity, polarization, density profile and electric mag uh, external magnetic field effects on the vortex motion and evolution are also studied. In three dimensions, the structure appears as an, an, an expanding magnetic ring with an internal magnetic field of up to 1,000 Tesla. 1,000 Tesla. 1,000 Tesla. That is way higher than the biggest instantaneous magnetic field that has been created technologically by man on planet Earth and it destroyed the equipment, but not the lab, when it was created. 1,000 Tesla. And this is my friends, for one pulse of a laser. Not a resonant structure. This is smacking that Tibetan singing bowl. Just bing, and it goes 1,000 Tesla. Now, what would happen if you gave it just what it needed, exactly in resonance with it, and you kept giving 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 it? 1,000 Tesla? Ha! I scoff at 1,000 Tesla. Such vortex structures suggest an interesting way of energy with more than 5% of the laser energy transportation to the ambient plasma as far as 50 microns away from the laser plasma interaction region, which may have applications in laser plasma based inertial confinement fusion and laboratory astrophysics. May, 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 pay attention. <laughs> oh God. Nonlinear structures such as solitons, vortices and collisionless shock waves are widely known in various areas of studies on these structures. On these structures are interesting and important both for fundamental research and applications, such as understanding of high energy particle acceleration in the universe, or reducing the damage of tornadoes, or, or reducing the damage of tornadoes. Here we go. <laughs> Along with the recent rapid development of intense laser technology, uh, such kind of structures can be generated and studied in detail in intense laser plasma interactions. You can create them in all kinds of systems. You don't need a big fancy laser, no. <laughs> Among them, electron vortices formed in relativistic laser plasmas have recently aroused uh, broad interests due to their wide presence in nature. Electron vortices formed in relativistic laser plasmas have recently aroused broad interest due to their wide presence in nature and potential applications in the laser electron and ion acceleration, as well as extremely strong magnetic field generation. Yeah, yeah you think? You think? D did you read Bostick's work from the 1950s? Did you? Compared with normal target sheath field in laser solid uh, interaction, in addition to ion acceleration, the vortex field can also be used to co-limit and accelerate ions, accelerated ions. It can co-limit. That means get them all going in a beam, a beam of ions. Mm, isn't that something that Ken Shoulders said? Oh, that was also something that Winston Bostick said. Well done. It's so, such an ingenious thing that you've discovered here. <laughs> and generate quasi-monoenergetic protons. Ooh, quasi-monoenergetic protons. What does that mean? That means protons that are the same energy. <gasps> protons. Protons are exactly the same isotope of hydrogen. Protium. And if they're the same energy, ooh, well, maybe we can just create coherent matter waves. Mm, I think you probably can. With energy of hundreds of mega electron volts. Hun hundreds of mega electron volts. Interesting. Blah, blah, blah. In this paper, by using multidimensional particle in cell simulations. It's a simulation. You know what? This is a physical experiment, and we've been talking about it for years. <laughs> Simulations? It's great. The data you're going to see is fantastic. 
We study the generation and dynamics of vortex structures during laser interaction with non-uniform plasmas with near critical density. We see that two-dimensional, 2D geometry there are bipolar, bipolar magnetic field structures. Bipolar magnetic field structures. What you mean like north and south moving with electron vortices with a center speed of up to 0.23 of the speed of light. The center speed of the electron vortices is 0.23 of the speed of light, which is much larger than the normal Hall speed. And we have found that electron, electrons moving around the vortex are relativistic. Electrons moving around the vortex are relativistic. It shows that a relativistic vortex structure exists in laser near critical density plasma interaction. In three-dimensional 3D geometry, we find that an expanding magnetic ring with an internal magnetic field up to 1000 Tesla can be generated. The magnetic field reduces as the ring expands. The magnetic field reduces as the ring expands. Now they're looking at something, if you look here, this is plus 2425, minus 2425. They're look at, looking at a 50 micron uh, uh, exotic vacuum object structure simulated in a computer, okay? They're saying that as those poles move out, the magnetic field strength gets weaker. But there is the opposite. If they move together and together and together and together, it's like, as I've described before, an ice skater with their arms out. Yeah, they've got their arms out and they pull their arms in. They get faster and faster and faster. And the field strength gets stronger and stronger and stronger. It gets weaker as it goes out. It gets stronger as it comes together. Well, Lutz Yentner from Quantum Mechanical Calculations at ICCF 22 in September 19, uh, 2019 calculated that exotic vacuum objects of a certain size with a certain, I think, 7.6 kilovolts uh, ring current would produce a field of 50 million Teslas. A thousand Teslas is good. It's better than any human has ever created with a technological device that we know of. But this is 50 million Teslas, which creates a pressure that's equivalent to the center of a neutron star. Do you think that if you have a pressure at the center of a neutron star, you couldn't create things that neutron stars do? I think you probably could. I think you could have self-collapse, self-compression of matter if you had a whole bunch of these things, right? Right? In a sphere with ions trapped either in them or with inside it, right? You can imagine that. You've got this whole sphere. And then as they get together, as, the, as they start to collapse, they get a stronger magnetic field. And as it gets closer together, get a stronger magnetic field and a stronger magnetic field. And it goes, boom! That is what Matsumoto is describing. That what is what observed by S. V. Adamenko. That is what I believe that we've observed as we've observed material disappearing. That's what you, when you cut a piece of John Hutchison steel and it's got loads of spheres that have disappeared. Where's it gone? It's gone converted to light and leptons, which have left the, left the party. They're not no longer in that matter metal matrix. They've gone. They've gone into the far field. This is what you are getting. You are getting self compression of this cell, this itonic cluster, as Takaaki Matsumoto calls it. So you can imagine that foo dragon ball. And you're energizing it at resonance and energizing it at resonance. And what is that going to do? One laser pulse gives you a thousand Tesla. What does two precisely timed energy inputs do? I don't know. But I expect it might be with low Q, with low, low losses, with high Q, low losses. I imagine that it would be more than 1,000 Tesla. It would probably be at least 1,000 and, and a bit. And if you keep adding it, and you keep adding it, that's going to build up that strength, which is going to make that compression work and work and work until... It compresses in on itself and you get a self-collapse and you get what's called a gravity decay. A gravity decay. That's what Takaaki Matsumoto called it in his work. Okay, so um, so uh, the structure of relativistic electron vortex, a laser pulse with a polarization along the Y direction and wavelength of 0.8 of a micrometer, peak intensity of 3.43 times 10 to the 19 watts per centimeter. That is a lot of watts per centimeter, but it's extremely small <laughs> time. It doesn't really last for a very long time. I think it's in femtoseconds or something. It's really it's like... <laughs> okay, so uh, blah, 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 blah. So... Um, uh, why is that frozen? Oh, it's gone to the next page. When, 
When the ultra short laser pulse propagates from the high density region to the low density region around the density down ramp part, there are two electron vortices formed on both sides of the laser propagation axis. In 2D geometry, each of these vortices can carry about 5% of the laser drive energy and move transversely. The vortex dissipates its magnetic and electrical energies to ambient plasmas along the path. Now, this slight, uh, image here is extremely important. There's a lot going on in it, and maybe I can hope to get it right. I don't know whether I can, but uh, when you understand what we have been seeing over many years, and you see what's calculated here in their super-duper fancy, uh, well-funded from every, pretty much every country in the world that might want to think about this uh, uh, project, it's very important what they've done, I believe. So thank you for doing this work. Um, so firstly, you have this uh, center of this vortex, which is one pole, and it's around about 24, 25 microns out over there. And down here, you have a negative 24, 25 microns. So this is about a 50 micron size exotic vacuum object, or in this case, because it's a 2D structure, um, this is your north or south, uh, north, so north, let's call it the red one, and south uh, um uh, sort of monopole type structures and I believe that these would join up like uh, the half soliton does in a pool. Now the reason these are so far apart is because they're uh, you're not actually looking at it are you? Sorry! <laughs> Sorry I'm looking at this I'm looking at this Sorry okay I'm with you. Right so uh, back back in the room. Um, so what we have is here. This is one side of, uh, of the double soliton structure, and this is the other one. And this is about 24, 25. This is about 24, 25. And over the uh, over this structure, we've got a 48, uh, 50 micron. So this is equivalent to maybe one of the structures that we saw on the structures on the um, uh, the fracture sample from John Hutchison, and. So uh, the reason that this has a defined width is because the laser pulse, it's actually got a diameter, right? It's co-limited, almost certainly, <laughs> it's a laser, uh, but it has a diameter. And this is like when you, when I've shared these videos in the past, when I was uh, doing the early videos on mining diamonds with Lion, when you get a plate and put it in a swimming pool on a sunny day, the solitons that form, uh, the, the half soliton that forms with the two uh, uh, counter-rotating vortices, they can only be outside of the initial uh, um, sort of turbulent uh, initiating structure, which is the plate that you put in the pool. So their limitation with their simulation here is probably they, they're trying to simulate a laser pulse that they can create with a defined energy and a defined uh, width. And so um, they want to be able to see something practically in experiment. They want to be able to simulate the actual fields going on by using this supercomputer and so that's essentially what I believe they've done but if they had a, a laser pulse of infinitely uh, narrow dimension uh, these two uh, solitons would be much closer together the shear forces would be far far higher and they would end up with much faster speed rotation and much far uh, much higher currents and uh, um, uh, potential on, on the double there and so forth but anyway uh, we'll we'll work with what they've got because it gives us a, 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 an initial sort of thing to think about. So what they found out is if, if they take this structure here, this uh, blue thing. Now, if we imagine this is traveling in this direction, let's say, um, uh, it has this leading edge thing here. It might be in this direction or this direction. Anyway, one one direction or the other. Um, I think I think it's this direction because the laser pulse would have come here and and this puts the the vortical structure going this way. Okay, so um, let's have a look. It has two types of current. It has a current that goes over the surface and off to, off to the side, and it has one uh, vortice current right in the center. Um, uh, and so you can see how that works, and, and it has this separate, se separate sort of capture current coming down here. This is, for me, an incredible, incredible chart um, that, I, that you're looking at here. Because I almost can't believe it, because it says, it says here, it says here, electric field volts per meter, right? And this is zero in the center line here. And what they're doing, they're showing as you go across this structure, as you go across this structure to the core, you have down here a minus one point, it looks about 1.8 times 10 to the 12 volts per meter here. 
at this point, 1.8 trillion volts per meter. And from there, across a two micron distance, roughly, to, from this peak down here, the, the one, minus 1 1.8 trillion volts per meter, to up here, this is about a two micron distance, yeah? Up here, it's 1.8 positive trillion volts per meter. So between here and here, unless I'm reading this wrong, we are looking at 3.6 trillion volts per meter. 3.6 trillion volts per meter. That's not a lot in your cathode ray tube to accelerate those electrons to hit the phosphor at the beginning, at the front of the cathode ray tube. That's like hundreds of volts, no more than kilovolts. This is trillions of volts. Now, at Sochi, Leonid Oretskev gave a presentation and in it he shared, I think it was three or four atoms that are known to fall apart when you completely ionize them. Okay. One of them, which I've discussed in the part part in the past with respect to the thallium doped uh, scintillator, um, sodium iodide thallium doped scintillator that we had in our signal experiment, the the experiment GS five point two glow stick five point two that produced this signal in uh, 2015-16, somewhere around there. That. Um, has thallium in it and one of the isotopes that ha has this kind of effect is thallium 205. Thallium 205 will be stable to the end of the universe. However, if you remove all of its electrons, it immediately beta decays and you get an extra proton and it goes to, th uh, to lead 205 instantaneously pretty much. And you wonder if you could I completely ionize you are going to get transmutation of a stable element. That's it. It's done. Sorry, it's done. 3.6 trillion volts. That's a lot of pulling electrons apart, isn't it? You know, you're going to want to grab electrons because you've got, on, on here, you've got positive. You know, your electrons are going to really want to go over here. And over here, you've got, um, you know, you, you, this, this is your negative volts and this is your positive volts. You're going to want to have charge separation going on here. And so you've got to wonder whether this particular thing here will literally rip all of the electrons off matter. And if it does, is it going to start ripping the electrons off the inside of matter? Because we already know that if we can get kinetic energies equivalent to 0.5 EV, according to Takaaki Matsumoto here, if you can get... Uh, um, particles of matter colliding with energy of 0.5 electron volts, then you will synth synthesize relic neutrinos, equivalents, cold neutrinos. And the cold neutrinos will facilitate the inverse beta decay of um, matter. And so you can imagine why this would instantaneously remediate nuclear waste. It would instantaneously do it. Because it has an incredible field separation here. And it will produce highly accelerated matter, which are highly compressed in this magnetic vortex. You will easily, easily, easily exceed the 0.5 electron volt kinetic energy of particles of matter in here. This will produce a lot, a lot of relic neutrino equivalents, cold neutrinos, and these will cause the inverse beta decay of elements. And if they're already unstable, them thems are the ones that are gonna go first. They're not gonna hang around with this maelstrom going on. They are not gonna hang around. They will stabilize instantaneously. And so right here, this data that they have shared has added the meat onto the physical observations that we have been observing and sharing and that have supporting those that have been talked about by Takaaki Matsumoto, Ken Shoulders, and uh, uh, all of those that witnessed this type of material, uh, uh, this type of radiation uh, that is able to instantaneously uh, remediate, particularly beta isotopes. So this is incredible. But on the leading edge of this, you can see it has this electron layer. 
this electron layer. Look at where this is, where this intense negative field is. You're getting this intense electron layer. And what does that mean? You're getting electron bunching. What do we know electron bunching does? Electron bunching causes coherence of electrons. What happens when you get coherence of electrons? You get Cooper pairs forming and then you get an electron condensate. This is what you are seeing in my view here. This is very, very important data. I don't know if the people that are looking at this are just going, well, that's interesting, or whether they really know what, they, what that implies. I don't know. I don't know. But th this is really adding meat onto the bone of what we have been showing in physical experiments, not simulations, but physical experiments for many years in support of those that have observed these things, like Ken Shoulders from the um, 1980s. Okay, so two magnetic field structures with opposite polarity moving with two electron vortices are observed as shown in figure 1a. The magnetic fields are along the z direction and have similar maximum intensities of around 10 to the 3 1000 teslas. These fields are induced by loop currents inside the vortex as shown in figure 1b. So this is uh, 1b. These are the loop currents. Okay. Uh, one can see that the two currents are composed, uh, composed of three different parts. The outer one, J out, shows a half ring structure and the inner one, J in, has a full ring structure. The last one is the capture current which is composed by electrons from the low density region. These electrons are trapped, trapped by electromagnetic fields of the vortex and some of them finally compose the inner current. They are trapped, they are compressed, they will cohere in my view. Now, what you can say is if this is traveling forward, because it has a central vortex going through, through here, which may be a gravitational azimuth, okay, and it, 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 it will always center on that uh, center line, because if it goes one way, it's it's not it's not it just it, it needs to be halfway through the structure and this is what you see you see this all the time you see these things halfway in hem hemispherical and when you see the tracks you get two lines okay or if they've got more subunits uh, like my ring does um, and th those subunits are spinning around you get as it travels forward it will punch out holes as it travels forward with the substructures which are fractal representations of the bigger one and they produce something like the lion paw prints. Okay. Yeah, so they're saying it's 24 microns there. Okay, so let's read on. However, electrons at the high density region around uh, X equals 18 microns have been compressed, compressed, forming a higher density layer. This is what I'm talking about here, this high density of electrons, high density, compression of electrons, removing their degrees of freedom will force them to have similar energies. And I believe that will force them to cohere. Because, you know, <laughs> that's what they do when you squash electrons together. Um, this asymmetric charge separation, charge separation. Remember what Ken Shoulders said. You're going to get exotic vacuum objects formed wherever you have charge separation and where you have this, when, like for instance, if you are firing a spark, the spark is going through a plasma and the plasma will create an electron vortex. It will, it will. This is what they're trying to experiment here um, and show here. Okay. The center for uh, uh, the asymmetric charge separation leads to the electric field distribution showing an eccentric circle shape. An eccentric shirt circle shape. Where have you seen this before? We've seen it in these kind of soft triangle uh, structures. We have seen it in these soft triangle such structures on the bull burn sample from 1986 all the way through to lion samples and more. The center velocities of the two vortices are measured to be 0.23 of the speed of light, which is close to the rel relativistic level. In our case, the laser intensity is order of magnitude. In our case, um, 
sorry, such high speed vortex has also been reported recently by Yi et al. when they studied the ion acceleration uh, driven by a moving electron vortex with much higher laser intensity and at different laser incidence direction. In our case, the laser intensity is order orders of magnitude smaller and there is no efficient ion acceleration observed in front of the vortex. We focus our studies on the vortex motion itself to figure out the dynamics of the vortex. We firstly investigate the single electron motion inside and around the vortex so I won't go into this you can read this but it's it's basically they are calculating what a single uh, it says the process looks like an electron fountain this will be very important when I talk about propulsion uh, and I will draw your attention to uh, this kind of thing in a minute uh, and then you will look at what I've observed uh, in the uh, magnetic vice slash uh, taking flight presentation that will be published tomorrow okay so um, so the maximum strength of the magnetic field according to results of a different uh, piece of research is proportional to the square root of the laser power. To the square root of the laser power and is appro uh, approximately equal to 2 times 10 to the 3 Tesla for the laser parameters used here. Uh, that's the separation, two up, one either side. This is a good agreement with the results of the simulations. Okay, so here they are showing uh, the uh, sort of weird kind of spirally motion that the electrons have around uh, the overall uh, um, uh, one side of the structure here. And for me, that's uh, less interesting. Um, uh, you know, uh, maybe it'll come interesting to me in the future, but uh, it's more the macro effects that I'm interested in here. Okay, energy dissipation of electron force. Along with the transverse motion, the vortex interacts with ambient plasmas. Both the static, electric, and um, magnetic energies uh, inside the vortex are dissipated during the interaction. In Fig 3, the evolutions of such energy. So they go into quite some detail here. The magnetic field is more dominant than the electric field inside the vortex. Uh, these energies are dissipated away and blah, blah, blah. Okay. We traced the magnetic uh, maximum magnetic field at the vortex center and found it varies quite slowly as shown figure 4a. It means that the magnetic energy dissipation is mainly by the vortex size reduction, not by weakening the uh, magnetic field. Okay, so it's actually good at persisting. Now, if you had an environment that was able... It, it, if you could get to a state where there's an equilibrium between the ability of the structure to pull in matter, to self-energize itself and expel uh, um, waste, as, as is described, not, it's not described like this, but it's described uh, how excess things are dis disposed of in, in Wheeler's Gions in 1954. He says that you, excess, you expel photons. I believe you're uh, generally getting rid of the energy in uh, uh, deep UV and soft X-rays. And Ken Schold has in fact found that this was the case. And if you look at the presentation that I shared from Anatoly Klimov, he said that when a plasmoid, which is the name that was given to it by uh, Bostic, when a plasmoid uh, is formed, the amount of UV that, pro that is produced uh, increases one million times one million times okay now the interesting thing about that is uh, and this is one reason i was interested in that uv lamp that i bought recently is that you need something like i don't know 1.25 electron volts something like that to split water okay but that is somewhere down in the infrared photons it's something like this. I might be getting this wrong, but it's about you can. You, in theory, you could get you uh, infrared to split water, but that obviously doesn't happen. And with catalytics, you can, and I've discussed this in recent presentations, you can get that up into the visible spectrum. But when you talk about UV, for instance, that a mercury lamp can produce, uh, it can produce um, photons that have a photonic energy of something like six, seven, seven and a half, six and a half, something like that, uh, electron volts. Well. If you have something that's producing a very vast number, a very large number of, of intense uh, UV, deep UV photons, well, wouldn't that split a lot of water? Wouldn't that ionize a lot of air? Wouldn't that ionize a lot of gases? Would you see something glowing 
around a metal or an object that was encapsulated with exotic vacuum objects. Wouldn't you see that? Because that is what you do observe. That is what you observe. You see ionization around these structures. Um, and depending on the level of intensity of the exotic vacuum object um, progression towards coherence, you will get uh, a yellow, an orange, a red. And then you won't see it, but it's there. It's going to be emitting UV. And it's then going to be emitting uh, soft X-rays. But those things could um, cause, for instance, a clear piece of quartz to become, um, you know, uh, coloured, maybe. But it would certainly uh, have an opportunity to potentially split water. And so that is something for me that's very interesting. And then if it's able to capture material, whether that's electrons or matter, and then co continue to cohere that, it might be able to provide the energy to persist. And would that be what causes something like these structures that are produced with an electrical discharge in a water channel? That would, uh, um, by the, the work from uh, Bogdanovich et al., which I uh, shared earlier, and which I'm just going to find uh, once again uh, for purposes of this. Um, let me just find that somewhere here. La, la, da, da. Somewhere here, where did I do it? Uh -huh. Give me a second. <laughs> uh, where are you, Mr. Bogdanovich? Yeah, yeah. So we've seen this before. So here, remember, this is a soliton. It's moving around and it's creating a luminous glow. Uh, two days after the experiment. Two days after the experiment. And I believe what you are seeing here is a, an intense magnetic vortex and that this is consuming matter. It's cohering it, it's condensing it, and in the process, it's having to le uh, release that energy just as plasma does to go to gas, as gas does to go to liquid, as liquid does to go to solid. It has to release energy and it's releasing energy in the in photons that are either directly being observed by this camera or are ionizing the air and you are seeing the ionization and this is self sustaining this is self sustaining okay um This is what I was talking about with uh, uh, Anatoly Klimov. Um, when when you get the uh, plasmoid forming, and this has got a Tesla coil on here and a discharge here, when you get the the uh, the plasma forming, uh, firstly you get these X rays of the X one two three, and then you see all these spectrum of the synthesized elements, and then once the plasmoid is formed. You don't see any spectrum from the synthesized elements because whatever light they're emitting is being uh, um, shifted to a broad uh, uh, and smooth spectrum here up to around about 255 kV mostly. Um, uh, and this is basically showing you what the uh, force shield is, <laughs> essentially. Okay. And when they're wonderfully calculating how close it is to relativistic, I'd like people to look at this um, here, which was from another Russian presentation from the 25th Sochi uh, in 2018. And the speed of light is 300,000 kilometers a second. And this natural ball lightning from the red and blue shift here was calculated to be uh, 100,000 kilometers per second, the speed of the electrons moving around the outside in 2009 uh, from a natural ball lightning. And uh, in this laser-induced compressed plasma, which sounds remarkably like this incredible piece of work that we're all talking about today, uh, this is laser-induced compressed plasma. This is 40,000 kilometers per second. So the, the rotation around that. So that's a, a very large proportion of the speed of light. This is one third of the speed of light. And uh, this is a, a large proportion of the speed of light. So you can see that what they're talking about is not something that hasn't been researched uh, plenty in Russia. Okay.
So uh, it means that the magnetic energy dissipation is mainly by the vortex size reduction. Okay, I think they mean by the vortex size expansion as it goes out. The the vortex. I don't know. It's kind of like I don't, I'm not sure this is correct what they've written there. But anyway. <laughs> Okay, laser plasma in, uh, effects in vortex generation dynamics. Although in our simulation cases, the vortex moved uh, velocity is larger than 0.1 uh, of the speed of light. Um, they've got some calculations here that you can possibly work it out from here. So they're saying that this is moving in a direction, uh, I guess this way, uh, at one tenth of the speed of light, which is uh, pretty good, <laughs> I'd say. Uh, to give you an idea, I think that that would uh, get you to Mars very, 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 very quickly. <laughs> stupid, stupid quickly. Uh, yeah. Uh, in, I think, minutes. Just minutes, I guess. Not very long. Okay, the process looks like an electronic fountain. Energy dissipation. Oh, I've gone, gone back over something here. I won't go into this uh, density profile effects. Uh, you can have a look at that in your own time. Laser polarization effects. For circularly polarized laser with double energy, the generated vortex is larger and faster. For circularly polarized laser with double energy, the energy generated, the generation vortex is larger and faster. I'm going to talk about this. It's something I wanted to talk about for a very, very long time. But it is no coincidence whatsoever that we saw these... Um, skirmion type magnetic vortex shells uh, being the the kind of skin of the electron condensate in the Vega Valley. It is no coincidence that you have red and green and then red alternate bands with a sort of hexagonal type uh, maximum packing density overall structure going on in the floodplain of the electron condensate in the Vega Valley. The reason I believe is one or two fold. It is doing something with the light. Now, an intense magnetic field will change the polarization of the light. It will change the polarization of light. This has been known for a very, very long time. Okay. And so either there is the remnants of the exotic vacuum objects in that floodplain of the Vega Valley, giving those green and red bands, or it has manipulated the matter. I believe, and I've believed for a long time, and one reason why I bought this polarizing filter here on this dino light edge with this polarizing filter here is that um, it reveals the track that you see, if I go and show you here, I believe that it, it revealed this track and these tracks here. I believe this track is revealed with a polarizing light only because it's either changed the material or there are subquanta of exotic vacuum objects in this track left over and that it is manipulating the incident light that hits it. Okay? So it's either um, changed the material like, like almost uh, the magnetic particles in a ferro cell. Uh, which like when you put an LED, the, the light kind of bends around and gives this impression of these uh, um, sort of curves in there, which is just a, a series of reflections of the light um, going round. It may be that it's manipulated the orientation of the metal crystal grains so that it presents this because of the intense magnetic field as it traveled through, or it's left subquanta of itself in there that when the light interacts with it, it causes the observation of a ghost of where the strange radiation traveled through this uh, uh, neutral uh, but intensely magnetic structure um, uh, travel through the material. And so, um, you know, that, that's what I, I think is going on uh, there to a degree. And I believe that when we look at those alternate green and uh, red polarized uh, sections in the floodplain, what you are looking at there is the again, the ghost of where the uh, electron vortices and alternate electron vortices were um, living when they were in their skirmion patch, as you might like to call it, if you want to mix your metaphors there. Uh, was I just showing my mugshot then, just in case I wasn't? I'm talking about this shadow here. 
this shadow structure here. Okay, all right. I'll look at your questions in a section, uh, in a session, in a, in a second rather. No, no, it mix my worms up. Um, okay, so this is very important. I wanted to speak about this for a very long time. I said I said that the the floodplain on the Vega Valley was a piece of magic, really, in terms of saying how intense this was. Uh, what's going on? External magnetic field effects, uh, structure and dynamics of electron vortex in three-dimensional geometry. Okay, I'm going to pause here and I'm going to ask if there's any uh, questions uh, here. Okay. Right. I'm going to have a quick look. So, hi Corky, great to have you join the technicians. Hi Jacob, hi Stephen Halls, hi Bestoic Primer, hi uh, WP for Truth. Hi Gordon, great to have you here. Uh, Jacob again. John, great. A great forum here. This is wonderful. So I'm going to see if you've got any questions. If you've got a question you really want to answer, drop it down the bottom and I'll pick it up in a sec. Okay. Do you think the Nimitz Tic Tac is ball lightning? I think it's two ball lightnings at either end of the device. I think this... Um, so what you, what you want is uh, if you energize a ball lightning to a certain degree, you can't pass through. You can you can be inside, but you you, you don't want to really be passing through the the ends of the stru of, of the coherent matter. And you, you probably don't even need to get it to a level of coherence. So um, here's the thing that right. So we, we, electrons interact with neutrinos. We know that because the the weak weak force involves those uh, two things. Um, and so, what I'm arguing is that, um, and you'll you'll see my argument in in uh, taking flight. Um, but essentially, if you've got relativistic rotation around here, and uh, it gets faster, the smaller the vortex you make, or the more you resonantly pump it, then you can have an environment where in in um, the work of uh, Lutzietner, he says that the uh, electron speed around the vortex uh, he calculated to be 0.8 of the speed of light in uh, for the case uh, that he was calculating. And so, if you have these extremely fast electrons, um, that and and uh, neutrinos, they, in my view, the matter in this vortex can interact with the cold neutrino condensate, the relic neutrino condensate that permeates the entire universe and therefore you will be able to condense that matter but you will also be able to traction through it and I will talk about that in more detail in the presentation uh, in um, a couple of days but essentially uh, you, you don't you don't want to go at fractions of the speed of light uh, in atmosphere and you've got uh, you know those things to take into consideration and you also don't want to make uh, when you've got coherent matter at either end which will wet together will wet together as you can see on on this uh, thing behind me they will wet together so if you can imagine i've got one ball lightning here and oh god if i can do this <laughs> one ball lightning here one, one ball lightning here and this is our tic tac right this is the wetted section but the intense one is at this end and the intense one's at that end uh, you might only want the ball uh to be like hemispherical on either end so that you can have things coming in and out of the center section okay or observe through the center section but then you to, to go up to fast speed you will want to energize those more and they will eventually wet themselves around the pill shape so it's it's a natural shaped object for this technology okay Once you've got it over the whole structure, you're energizing the whole structure. And so the, the ball lightning is a stretched ball lightning. So you wouldn't be in the coherent matter layer when it gets to the point of being like a, a Star Trek uh, force shield. It, it will be around the whole structure. But the reason you have a pill shaped is it, it's it's minimum energy surface. Sorry, it's a minimum curvature around the cylindrical, cylindrical section and it's minimum cur curvature on the end. So to, to contain a volume, you're, you, you have a couple of objects options you, you have like a toroid um a a sphere and a pill shape these these are kind of basically the options you have um well I, I, listen I, I i don't want to get totally into the design of, of uh, various anti-gravity craft um that's not the purpose of this presentation really but um uh yeah so um we can talk about that another time Okay, so a 
Okay. Yeah, and um, Gordon, in my view, um, uh, the relic neutrino condensate in the entire uh, universe is the uh, source of the uh, infinitesimally small corpuscles that rain down from the cosmos. Not from the sun, but from the cosmos, according to uh, Tesla, which he apparently talked about in the 1880s and 1890s in various lectures, and then uh, was a little bit bitter in his commentary uh, when the concept of a neutrino came out. And um, th at that time, there wasn't the concept of uh, relic neutrinos, uh, but that came later. And I think a Japanese person in 19, 1959 was the first person to suggest that uh, neutrinos were probably um, the cause of the gravity we observe. And it isn't until you get to the CERN technical group uh, paper from 2010 where it is specifically said that, that every observational uh, uh, aspect of gravity could be explained by re relic ne neutrinos. And given that that's the case, then anything that would require uh, to uh, um, shield you from gravity and to work through this condensate would need to interact with them. And I believe exotic vacuum objects and structures made thereof uh, uh, will facilitate this. Would the Evo carry the weight or would you ride inside? You would ride inside the Evo. Inside the Evo, gravity can't take, act on you. Neither can inertia. Um, and so you can change direction instantaneously. The question is, how do you do that? Well, you would energize uh, um, different parts of the structure to act. And um, Kenneth, Kenneth Shoulders is very keen to say he doesn't care about anti-gravity, he cares about propulsion. That's a very clever thing to say because uh, you're not worried about uh, um, having a gravitational body to push off. Um, but you need to interact with the sea of energy uh, throughout the universe and you need a wheel work and it needs to be a wheel within a wheel within a wheel uh, as is uh, said in the Bible. And that is exactly what you have uh, here in this structure, this uh, inferred structure that I derived from John Hutchison's structure. You have a wheel within a wheel within a wheel. Round like a circle in a spiral, like a wheel within a wheel, never ending or beginning on a never spinning reel. Like a snowball down a mountain and a carousel balloon. That's the one. Okay. So yeah, you would be inside, and and as as I've said in the past, if you are if you have a ball lightning go into water, it will boil the water. What is it doing? Maybe it's ionizing the water and splitting the water. Maybe some of that is splitting the water, but it, the condensation process produces a lot of heat that gets ejected from the coherent matter structure that boils the water. But inside a ball lightning, it can carry water without boiling it. It can carry sand without sintering it, which means it's at least below 100 degrees, and so therefore inside the structure you would only really have to protect yourself uh, from the uh, soft x-rays and beta particles which you could reasonably protect yourself from and I think we, we've shown how you can do that um, and, and I showed you in this presentation uh, when I showed you the shield and I, I called it how do you make a Star Trek uh, force shield uh, and I um, used the example of the jewel from the uh, um, lion experiment which I'm just trying to find right now and it's here so I will show you that again so uh, you have to protect yourself uh, with with this skin and this skin is a few microns thick so uh, you, you if, if you were in a craft you would typically use a, a, a you know you could slap on some lead bearing paint and that would probably be sufficient to prevent the X uh, the beta particles and the x-rays and the UV from penetrating the craft so you would be stay safe within there but you wouldn't want to look through a window because the UV would go through a window so you would have some sort of camera that was able to look without getting too damaged uh, through the coherent matter sheath or near coherent matter like I say it doesn't necessarily have to be perfectly there um, to do the job um, okay Hi, son of Overbook. Great to have you here. Hi, Dan Moretti. Hi, Stephen Halls. Okay, so... Um, the Stoic Primer. I have plans for something analog of this in the cavitation shockwave heater that uh, creates a tube of colder vortices with a hotter... So I'd, I'd definitely go and look at the work of Bin Zhuen Huang. Uh, he's uh, at the 
um, in, uh, the Energy Research Center at Taipei University. I've had a lot of interactions with him, and um, he replicated the ultra experiments. Now, in ultra experiments, you are creating your yin yang, and uh, you are creating those absolutely certainly at a resonant node, and you are pumping them with each pulse of sound. And at the resonant node, you're going to have coherence going on. So rather than one incredibly intense energy pulse, focused in a location and then doing the simulation here and seeing it observed in 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 uh, 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 physical experiments the beauty of the ultra experiment is you have a a plane that fixes the yin yangs in place and then you pump them and you pump them and so you get this uh production of like easy water you get plasma form because of the shear forces you can go and have a look at nature paper i think from 2017 where they had a, a water jet and i will probably talk about this in a separate presentation um you have a water jet and it hits a, a sheet of metal and it forms a toroidal plasma vortex uh, around it and so you can imagine that this is happening on that aluminium foil aluminium foil for those in america and um we physically seen these things spinning round and spinning round like this and it would appear that we've seen them uh transmuting matter and we've certainly seen uh, strange radiation tracks coming out of one of the cores of these cavitation spots um, or these solitons. These are solitons, but they are from charge separated water. So therefore you have charges spinning around at intense speeds, which makes what? It makes a magnetic field. So it ends up creating the same kind of thing that you see in a plasma vortex. And in fact, as I've said, it makes plasma. So you, you effect, effectively create on a flat plane in the ultra experiments essentially the same thing that we've been talking about in this presentation. Does it need to get to the gigajoules or whatever it is, uh, petajoules in a uh, femtosecond that maybe they're using or whatever it is? I don't think it does because we are using resonance and we are rolling that snowball down a mountain. And we're getting bigger and bigger and bigger. We're the... Um, we're the, uh, the uh, how do we say, the opera singer and the glass. And the glass is there and they go, ah, oh, and, and nothing happens. They go, ah, oh, and then the glass sings back at its resonant frequency. And then the, then the opera singer sings and maintains that pure tone and the glass smashes. When you have resonance, just like Tesla did with his earthquake machine in, in the Manhattan Tower, they felt that they were going to knock down the tower because it was a self uh, uh, um, it was a frequency uh, finding resonance uh, uh, device and it was only a little thing and it goes dick, 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 and it becomes uh, you know able to match the resonance swing of the building detect it and then reinforce the vibration at which it doesn't lose any energy I've done this in the forest it's quite fun you can go to a forest and you see these old stands where the tree has died and what you do is you you give it a good hard shove that is banging that is banging on on the tibetan bowl and what you do is you look at the tree and you see at what frequency it's vibrating you put your hands on it you feel how how it's vibrating and then you push and you push and you push and you work with it you work with it just adding energy each time and you will knock over that tree what you've got to hope is it doesn't snap halfway up and come and knock your head in the head but i've done it quite a few times and it's really quite fun to do as long as you don't die, but there we go. Um, <laughs> okay. Yeah, so the, the, the weight inside the exotic vacuum object, in my view, would be completely screened. And when I say that, the the uh, I, I describe the push, it's based on push gravity. Push gravity, I, I believe, is because of the relic neutrino flux from the cosmos. And I discussed that in the presentation that I will publish tomorrow. And uh, you will see that I've, I've shared all the evidence, but you you didn't really know why I was sharing it since the beginning of 2017. But it's, it's it brings those things together. I can't, it's a long discussion. It, it was two hours then. And uh, I, I can't really do it here um, and get through the rest of this presentation. The, the, the thing of bestoic prime is about the cavitation shock waves, it will eventually destroy your heating pipe apparatus. And be careful because if you have... Re I like the ultra experiment because the, the material on which you are creating the resonance and the coherence and the transmutation, it fails. And the, the, the sooner or later, the, the 
areas that form the yin yangs they break and so you've got a limit to the level of elements you can synthesize now obviously people will want to maybe try thicker aluminium and see how far they can push it but you must be aware that the strange radiation can kill and you must be aware that if you go too far you will synthesize very heavy elements and these very heavy elements will fission when the coherent matter breaks down and releases them and that that will cause traditional radiation uh, which will kill Uh, Corka, I, I don't know what I'm going to do on the day. Uh, maybe I know. I know on Wednesday I will be talking to the Russian community during the day. So uh, let, let's see what what can happen then. Um, thank you, field inter in, uh, interference. Hi, Elias. Great to have. There's a really nice forum here today. Great to see you all. Okay. I know what I'm going to do on the 10th or after. I'm going to fully explain why I decided to share Evo Blaster as the very first video uh, of the Vega experiments. That video is, it, it shows so much in such a short video clip about how this technology works but also um, the awesome power potential of it which Ken Shoulders has talked about but to see it there is incredible and I'm then going to follow that up with a conversation that I've had with Alexander Shishkin uh, a couple of days ago and uh, the latest paper of Alexander Shishkin which he's given me permission to translate and and publish so um th th this is going to be a pretty special week i have to say and i will get around to doing the kickstarter for the vega valley artwork uh, i was a bit tied up uh, with the uh taking flight magnetic um vice presentation sorry okay right so um i'm i'm gonna say Hi Benjamin, hi, great to have you here. Right, so I'm going to um, now uh, go to the second uh, part of this paper. There's less to discuss in this, um, but I think what's beautiful is what is actually said. So uh, we need to uh, look at this because um, it's, it's rather special. Okay, all right, so back on the paper. <sighs> la 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 la. Uh, the electron vortex distributions are two different instances are shown in figure 6 BC. As one can see that similar vortexes, vortices are generated and propagate transversely with a speed of 0.36 of C. So this is getting quite large. So these are just in their experiments. And, you know, no one wants to talk about very, very high speeds, but this is very, very high speed. So, you know, this is only, only nearly half of 0.8 of, of C. So I believe that we can get to point eight of C, and you know what that means? We can get to Alpha Centauri in six years. We can get to Alpha Centauri, the next solar system nearest to us, in six years. That is just mind-boggling. It's just mind-boggling. And you know what? That's exactly what the Russians said in 1992 in a debrief from the CIA. And they said they used cold fusion technology to extract the hidden energy within matter. The hidden energy within matter. Well, what is that? That is converting matter to light and leptons. And then it says that the, the, the technology that releases that energy from the matter is the same technology that provides the propulsion. And that all of the energy you would need uh, to do an interstellar journey would come from one kilo of iron. One kilo of iron. To take your ship to Alpha Centauri in six years. Okay, so the polarization there, okay, uh, la la la. Right, structure and dynamics of electron vortex in three-dimensional geometry. For a normal block plasma, this is a simulation, so they call it that. Uh, such structure transformation, tra such a structure transforms to a 3D ring 
structure as shown in figure 10. A smoke ring like structure. I kid you not. A smoke ring like structure was observed inside the plasma in 3D simulation. Well, isn't that a surprise? <laughs> and it's just like, how can all of these institutions from around the world be surprised about that? How can it not be obvious? The toroidal magnetic field in the ring structure can be higher than the 1000 Tesla when it is fully generated, but it drops when the ring expands. Unlike in 2D vortex, the magnetic field dissipates. D dissipation is mainly induced by ion motion. However, in 3D case, both the structure expansion and the particle motion weaken the magnetic field. But if you're keeping it in the same place and you're charge pumping it and charge pumping it and charge pumping it, pumping it, it will rip matter apart. It will rip matter apart. And subsequent to publishing the presentation that I gave to um, APEC, um, I, I will expand upon that with other data and some of that I will do with the Russian presentation which you'll get to look at as well but I when I've described how this will rip matter apart I've actually already shared the image you just haven't had the tools to be able to interpret it now this is data when I'm looking at it and seeing exactly what it is doing that is the only thing that explains it it is ripping matter apart and it's grabbing it from one side and it's smashing it down on the other it's a black hole which is compressing it in making it into proto matter into prima materia it's throwing it over and slapping it down on the other side where it's forming typically carbon and things like silicon and so on and calcium uh however in 3d case both the structure expansion and the particle motion weaken the magnetic uh, uh field okay in conclusion, vortices and magnetic ring structures are found during ultra-short intense laser interaction. This is banging your Tibetan bowl with near-critical uh, density plasma. The uh, current direct, directly driven by the laser and return... <laughs> the current directly driven by the laser and the return current of background... Uh, Electrons formed a closed current which firstly generates the local magnetic field. The density down ramp introduces an asymmetric electric field. The combined fields lead to the transverse drift motion of the vortex. So they're explaining how an electron vortex uh, travels. This is propulsion. This is propulsion. Proved. They see in their test, which is not optimum, which is just a single pulse, 0.2 of the speed of light. Using the EM EMHD model of dependence of vortex velocity on the plasma density gradient and the laser intensity, blah, 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 blah. External or background magnetic fields with the same direction as the vortex can enhance the vortex motion. In three-dimensional geometry, a smoke ring-like magnetic structure is observed. These structures convert laser energy to magnetic energy, just like the work of Paul Kollak, the... Um, the electrical discharge converts to magnetic energy in a soliton by forming a, a discharge channel which forms loads of kink instabilities and then these merge together to one to uh, torus that has a current that is the multiple of the number of kink instabilities that merged into the structure. Okay, These structures convert laser energy into magnetic energy. Right, there we go. And look at this! Look at this! Look at this! Oh dear. This is the ring and the spot. The ring and the spot. And look at it. We have one, two, three, four, five, six. Roughly, it's a, it's a geometric structure that forms in this way. And this is what I'm going to... This is going to be important uh, to the magnetic vice and to the presentation on uh, taking flight. But you can see here, this is your plasma sort of disordered thing here around this front head you have the plasma density is lower okay if, if i consider these as pla plasma density isolines uh they're they're kind of like your uh structure here Th this might be the down ramp by anyway so that there might be a component there but you can see that there's a definite dome here this is our mushroom. This is our mushroom of our magnetic monopole type structures. And you've got material being pulled in the back here. Pulled in the back here. 
okay? So what I'm, I'm gonna leave this here because the, the taking flight magnetic vice presentation uh, will draw on why, why this is just wonderful for me to see years later having shared so much with you and, and pointed out what I think is important. It's going to play a role in our conversations in the future. And then to see it here calculated by a supercomputer with all these fancy pants universities involved and Department of Energy and the China and blah, 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 uh, major funding institutions. It's just great to see them getting on board. Um, but uh, th there we go. So uh, this is our ring and our spot. This is our Ra. This is what the Egyptians thought uh, is how the sun works. I agree with them. Um, and uh, uh, I, I will explain, you know, w w when you've got your, uh, your two north and south poles uh, on your uh, solar prominences, um, I, I will talk about uh, coronal rain. I, w I, I, will all I will then show you where we've already seen the coronal rain type effect going on between two uh, magnetic solitons of uh, opposite polarity on uh, 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 the um, uh, John Hutchison fracture sample. Uh, I, I, I encourage people to go and look at paper, uh, presentations where I've talked about the John Hutchison fracture sample. You might be able to spot what I'm talking about, but it, it's all in there. That that one one sample has everything. It has the black holes. It has the ejections from the white holes. It has the the yin yangs all over it. The the what helped to do. Um, in fact, I've got it here. It's just it's, it's probably it probably is my favourite sample. It just it just looks like a piece of metal. But uh, you know that it's all there. It's all there. It's all in this little beautiful sample here. I'm just gonna uh, flick cameras here. It's all in this beautiful sample here. This. This wonderful thing here it just doesn't look like much but that is a piece of magic absolute magic thank you John Hutchison <laughs> okay so I'm gonna see your questions here and uh, then I will um, uh, uh, call it a night. Um, what I can say is if you haven't checked out on remoteview.icu the latest um, sections that I've uh, released of uh, Takaaki Matsumoto's uh, book from 2000, uh, it was uh, uh, Simeon Hain uh, noticed that in there he was discussing that uh, uh, baryonic matter is collapsed. And so, yes, that he can add. You can add another one to the list that's observed the the reality in this technology, um, uh, and uh, some other great, great insights in that. So please go and read it. I think we're up to page ninety one now, out of two hundred and eighty seven or whatever. So, right, glass. Uh, okay, I'm gonna read what you're uh, writing here. If there's anything I need to interact with, I will. CSA has many similar samples from John. Well, great. Uh, it will be, you know, um, they they will have the same kind of effects on them. And, um, you know, some will be more um, useful than others. Uh, but we have a picture now from so many different experiments uh, that all pointed in one direction. And you just had to pay attention. And then you compare that to the archaeological record and it's absolutely certainly the case that people with from our past the people that effectively brought us into existence knew how to use this technology and I have argued clearly uh, that I believe that they could use this technology to even come to this planet and I think what you're seeing right now is that either these people are being used to find out the metrics behind it because other people don't really know what's going on or there is a slow walk of releasing this uh, understanding or they genuinely have never heard of uh, Ken Shoulders and they don't know anything about electro electron vortices. I mean, it's just laughable, but, you know, it's quite possible. I, I mean, I, I was trying to find out what cold fusion, how it worked for four and a half years before I, I made the connection to what, John Hutchison and Ken Shoulders have done and um, when I started talking about it I mean I, that had never been mentioned once in the in the conferences that I went to it just hadn't been mentioned not once 
and even people in the project and, and people following the project. It just hadn't been mentioned. So I don't blame them, but it's just wonderful that, it, you know, it, it's almost like they've independently discovered exotic vacuum objects. <laughs> but they are obviously not understanding the importance of, um, uh, you know, the... the uh, the, the 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 fact that this is basically a gion it's 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 all of those things it, it, i think they're going to i don't know <laughs> anyway it's wonder, wonderful th this is wonderful to see when you when you look at this and uh, you realize that yes th this is our ring and our spot this is our ring and our spot and uh it, you know you can even see that these are that there's a a bigger bit here and then it goes into a pinch and a bigger bit here and it goes into a pinch and a bigger bit here and it goes into a pinch and you almost see a wave function going around here now is it a helical wave function going around here maybe and maybe if you could resolve this with a better supercomputer you might end up you might end up with something that looks like this and you might end up with something that looks like this but we do know for certain that an imaged coherent matter structure has these blobs around it and ends up being a kind of hexagon shape. So this is actual from physical experiment imaging. Uh, this is from mathematical project projection from quantum mechanics. And this is derived from observing very large macro structures on John Hodgson's uh, fracture sample. Uh, and I'm pretty sure it's pretty close to what it should be. <laughs> Um, uh, Corky Axel says uh, Evos interact with space time itself um, if you are doing what I'm saying you are doing here which is depressurize okay th this is the, the important part and you will see my argument in in, um, uh, in uh, uh, taking flight magnetic um, magnetic vice it, it depressurizes and pressurizes space uh, this is a warp drive and what is space what, I, what I'm saying is there is a coherent matter condensate through the entire universe it is more dense near gravitational bodies because co uh, uh, relic neutrinos are gravitationally lensed and gravitationally attracted so we there is a neutrino sphere around the moon there's a neutrino sphere around the earth there is a neutrino sphere around the um the sun and that is all described in this book uh the neutrino spheres but between those bodies there are fluxes of neutrinos uh condensates the relic neutrino condensates and between the bodies uh there is uh, a st still the same condensate it's just it's it's more equal than others as it were <laughs> if that's a, it's, i've joked about that before um so yeah the and 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 the flux of relic neutrinos define the observation of gravity and they interact with matter now if you want to change the speed of time i i'm saying that inside one of those exotic vacuum object structures time won't occur the same and also because i believe that consciousness works through this medium consciousness um won't be the same inside the structure and in fact, not only may gravity not act on you, time and the normal things of space may not act on you. And I've discussed this. In fact, I've discussed this to try and talk to um, um, Axel about this in the past. Um, it, outside of an exotic vacuum object, time may f move forward in the normal way, but inside it may not. And so things that are encapsulated in one of these structures may not age so you can effectively go into the future and i've said in the past i know I'm, I'm pretty certain that you can use this technology to go in into the future effectively so you could have a king that could live for thirty six thousand years because he was sleeping in this thing overnight or over a year and he would just pop up every couple of months but he hadn't aged he wouldn't age because for time for him had been paused every time he went into one of these structures even when he's traveling and in fact the other the other thing is is that whilst it might take you six years to get to alpha centauri for you inside the tra spacecraft it, it you you would lose sense of time you would be basically unconscious but when you arrived at the other end you basically would not have aged much at all so for you it would you would perceive it as instantaneous 
you would literally get to anywhere, any point in the galaxy, as if you were traveling faster than light. <laughs> because for you, time would have would have not moved forward. So, but I have no way to understand how this technology would ever allow going back in time. It doesn't allow time to go back for um, to go back in time. It just allows uh, uh, time to be paused and to relatively you go forward in time. Yeah, things. So the thing is, um, OK, I didn't really want to go into this, but um, essentially, if you have the coherent matter around it, anything hitting that coherent matter can bend around it, maybe, or just basically superconduct through it. So um, when when you have something become, uh, it, well, it firstly, you'll see it. And then as it energizes, uh, it'll go through various colors until it goes into bl blue and then into UV. And then when it's fully coherent, it may not allow, it'll either not allow light through it at all, or it may just, the light will not see it. It doesn't see it. It's basically not in our normal space time. So the, the thing will become invisible. It is there, but it, it, it you do not see it. All, all the light bends around it. So you, you see that what's behind it as if it wasn't there. So crafts using this technology uh, at some point, levels of uh, intensity of the uh, um, the technology that allows the gravity to not act on the body inside uh, they they may basically disappear from our, our ability to see them the interesting thing is that they should still output uv light uh, as a point source or x-rays and therefore if you had something that was able to fluoresce you could look at that to know that there was the craft above you but you wouldn't see the craft, but you would see the representation of the the uh, fluorescing of the fluorescent material um, uh, uh, based on um, the UV. You can't see the UV with your eyes. You might get a suntan. <laughs> you like if if there was one of these craft hanging about in its transparent state, um, uh, you might get burnt, or, or you might get worse. You might get cancers because of the X-rays. But really. Um, so there, there's a, a series of artifacts, and I shared this actually with Stephen uh, a day or two ago, um, where they're supposedly from South America, and um, they they have this image of this person holding these artifacts, and the artifacts are meant to be held up, and there's a a, a, a kind of like spaceship type craft with rays coming out of it. Okay. And it's just wonderful to have seen this a few days ago, having speculated that this might be the case in the past. And these artifacts are painted with some sort of fluorescent paint. And the idea is you hold it up and, and it fluoresces. And I believe that that is... Uh, so if you, if you were expecting these people to come, you would know that they had come by uh, using this uh, uh, tool. And in fact, it might be... And I, I've argued this in the past with members of the MFMP. I think we need to be using fluorescent panels uh, to see if we are creating exotic vacuum objects. And um, I think we need to go back to that as a detection method because uh, what Klimov shared last week and which I published on our channel is that he is saying when the, when the uh, plasmoid, the ball lightning, the technologically produced ball lightning is formed, um, you get this million-fold increase in UV. And so um, uh, you can't see it, and you want to be able to see that you're producing it, so um, you, know, you would want to uh, have some sort of UV material to be a detector. So yeah, bismuth you would use because bismuth is the most diamagnetic material. So if you were creating a skin, or if you were creating a, a torus below your craft, by if you if you oh god if, I didn't want to talk about this either but anyway uh, if you have your craft and you're creating the two vortices one above and one below they create these intense magnetic fields and if you want to push off that magnetic field you'd want to have a material that wants to move away from a magnetic field this way you can keep the coherent matter outside of your uh, uh, living quarters as it were but you are um, uh, you're pushing off the thing that you're energizing. 
And so it, it's a way to do kind of like propulsion with it. So diamagnetic materials want to go away from a magnetic field, uh, uh, whether it's north or south, it doesn't matter, it just wants to get away. And uh, bismuth is the most diamagnetic material. So you would build the hull of a spacecraft uh, that you wanted to use this technology with preferentially with bismuth. I mean, if you were uh, scientific and you understood that this was creating a magnetic field, let's say in the 1950s, you would think, well, we've got to use bismuth. We don't have another choice. <laughs> and you would, you would skin it with uh, bismuth. Yeah, I, I agree with that the, the, there's a concept of the time reverse, but I don't think you need to go that way. Um, I think you can um, you can uh, stimulate the uh, the DNA to kind of like remember how to fix things, if you know what, or fix itself. Um, so, something along those lines. Um, I just, I can't intuitively, with all that I've seen, know how you can do time reversal. Uh, I know how you can pause time. So, like, you know, you have these Sumerian kings that are supposed to live for 36,000 years. I can see how that would be plausible. Uh, you can clone things as well. That's a whole other matter, which I'll get into. It's another long presentation, but um, how the cloning works and how there's evidence for that. That might be part of uh, uh, um, uh, the book for... Um, John Hutchison. But anyway, um, the, the you shouldn't do cloning in the, the spiritual world. It's, it's, it's not good. Bob, will you discuss how much energy is required and likely from where to create these propulsion effects? I don't think you need a lot. I think you just need resonance. And I think basically once you've ionized some air, you will uh, need to have some intense capacitor plates to accelerate that and once it starts producing the vortex it you just need to maintain that resonantly and uh, you can use sound and you can use uh, resonant electromagnetic vibration uh, so on so uh, typically you your materials would involve uh, probably quartz or barium titanate or uh, pzt and i believe this is why you have these linked patents for I talked about that before these patents were released when I visited the John Hutchison lab in January and I published it. It was January 6th, uh, 2017 or 18, uh, 17, 18, 18, when I visited the lab and it was later that the Salvatore Pi patents came out. But I said based on work in the 1950s published in New Scientist in 1963 that if you had a, a, a piezo material on the outside of aluminium, I think is best because it is... Uh, um, one isotope so it's easier to cohere it um, then you can have um, uh, uh, the production of coherent matter in there which makes it superconductivity at any temperature and so you can get levitation of that and and so forth so you're actually creating um, this kind of material but anyway uh, uh, related to that is the Vega Valley here um, and I think that's important and also you should go and read in the I think that the middle section of the bit of uh, Matsumoto's paper where he talks about how superconductivity was observed by uh, Mike McCubrey in palladium, deuterated palladium. And he observes, uh, he, he suggests that's because the, the itonic clusters are building up in the, the crystal grains and, and the gaps in the crystals. Uh, and then they get so big that they wet together. And so what you are seeing here in the Vega Valley is the same process. <clears throat> and, and so you end up with a whole, the whole material being coherent. And that, I believe, is what's going on in the Salvatore Pi, Pi patterns. <laughs> can I pause time for the universe but keep the time well that is okay Charlie so that is you know I hadn't looked at it that way but yes you could yeah so like if you wanted to go back in time is that is that gonna work yeah like if you want to relatively go but then you're gonna age aren't you you're gonna age uh 
No, you're, you're, the, all, all you're doing is you're pausing their time and you're going forward in time. And when they come out, they're just going to see you as older. Like if you, if, you, if you put the whole of planet Earth into one of these bubbles, it basically froze time for planet Earth. Uh, then And you're outside. You would just get older. So it looked like they went, I don't know. Anyway. <laughs> Push the light. Yeah, you might be working a bit hard there. Okay, there's a lot of questions here. I, Steve Bannister and uh, Bob, will you discuss how much energy is required and likely from where to create these propulsion effects? Um, I really don't think it's a lot. Um, I think Tesla claimed that you would need uh, a couple of batteries. I don't. I don't think it would need more than that. I think it's all about resonance. Uh, I think if you look at the Greb Grebenikov platform, um, I think it's almost nothing. Uh, and uh, I, I will talk about that in future. I've got a lot of data that I've collected and, and understanding for that. Um, and again, uh, something that I've talked about today, polarization of light, circular polarization, I think plays an important role in that um, working uh, because it, it increases. It, it, it's not that you, it's necessary, but it, it increases the process. And, and I believe that... Um, uh, John Hutchison was using circular polarized light in many of his antennas and I think that promoted the production of uh, intense exotic vacuum objects and so <clears throat> um, I will talk about that more uh, in context of Grebenikov and uh, um, these systems but um, uh, I don't think it's necessary for producing uh, so-called anti-gravitational lift I don't I don't think it's necessary I think the bar ba the biggest barrier to developing this technology is actually believing it's possible and all of the um, misinformation and fear and uncertainty and doubt and interference that we've all had to suffer through our entire lives and uh, it's interesting to see that you know we're saying Ken Shoulders is saying these things can easily travel at point one of the speed of light with ver very relatively easily mean easy means and you have a science paper here that's saying we've done this on a supercomputer and oh my god it comes out as a as a soliton just like a smoke ring and isn't that amazing it travels at point two of the speed of light and the internal ring currents are going at you know one thousand te tesla and producing one thousand tesla and you've got point three six of the speed of light and, and wow isn't that amazing. <laughs> Question, the healing power of this tech. Um, water that has aggregated monopoles uh, from the this technology could be used by biology. Uh, and I, I, I did a presentation on this called the Elixir of Life, uh, Aqua Vitae or whatever it is. Um, you can go and have a look at that. And in Shishkin's cavitator, Shishkin has a cavitator, and it's like uh, some aluminium cut with grooves. And as it spins round, it cavitates at the same pot spot. And this produces strange radiation, which is a form of magnetic magnetotoro electrical radiation, uh, which he says is the same thing as Ken Shoulders exotic vacuum objects and the neutral form which we might call a black evo he calls a string vortex soliton this is the strange radiation that gets emitted these are these birdies that you see on x-rays these are these magnetic monopole type structures these carry ions with them and because when they explode they emit the ions at extremely fast velocities they can damage your dna and kill red blood cells and and damage the dna in um 
uh, white blood cells. I've additionally said because uh, uh, they've been observed since the 1950s in Russia, this emission of this radiation to transmute beta isotopes, that since your sugar molecules that make up your DNA are um, one, one in every trillion are carbon-14, that they will cause the carbon-14 to become nitrogen-14 and it'll smash up your DNA. And secondly, potassium-40 in your body will be stimulated through reverse beta decay, inverse beta decay, to emit a 1.552 uh, mega electron volt uh, beta particle. This will also cause damage in your body. The reality is that uh, when Leclerc had his extreme cavitator working, it uh, gave him and his partner, with one hour exposure, uh, radiation sickness that took them two years to get over and they nearly died. And in the case of um, Shishkin, using x-ray film and actual mice uh, in mice experiments, he found that the radiation flux would have been sufficient for one hour exposure to kill a man from his device. However, he extracts the water... And the water, as you know, will have produced some oxygen. The oxygen is uniquely paramagnetic of those elements. And I've described how that occurs, that the, the magnetic monopoles then bind to the oxygen nucleus. And then the, the oxygen becomes very special in that water. And then maybe can recombine to make water. But the water is different water than it was before. Uh, and water, not all water is the same. Absolutely. Certainly now. I used to think this was absolute bunkum, but it's not. <laughs> Um, so uh, the, the water is different and he feeds those to plants and uh, seeds that are treated with this grow faster, they're more resilient and um, uh, they're stronger plants than ones that are fed with the same tap water or whatever that wasn't treated in the cavitator. Now part of that might be creating monoatomic new elements that are in the water uh, or part of that might be the monopoles that are uh, uh, bound to the oxygen in that water um, one or other may be playing the role or it might be a combination of both but certainly the emissions from the uh, cavitator uh, when you are processing the water are just really not something you want to be exposed to So Corky says, Star Trek was so accurate, her predictive programming. Ken Shoulders and John Hutchison in 1997, I believe it was, spent about, a, well, a long period of time with uh, Larry King, some directors, people at CNN, um, uh, and the writers or whatever it was from Star Trek. And they discussed what technology they would need to put into the programming to prepare people for what was coming down the line, uh, what, what this technology implied would be possible. And I believe that if you just looked at it, you would realise that this had already been done by humans. Uh, Stephen Halls, uh, I've I just become aware of uh, that he's been interested in symbology. He's certainly got a lot more experience than me. I never, ever thought in a million years that when I set out to find out if... if uh, Pons and Fleischmann uh, uh, had any validity in what they were claiming, um, I would end up realising that this was uh, the occult technology, the God's toolbox, um, and that pretty much every power symbol on Earth is a representation of various aspects of this technology. I just never expected that. Um, and uh, so uh, I think uh, his contribution is going to be very valuable in terms of understanding uh, um, you know some things that may not have been considered now we're on this level of understanding yeah the philadelphia experiment um can move things through time and space i don't think it, it went back in the past maybe it, it did or maybe it put the rest of the world to move forward in the future i don't know um but certainly with the philadelphia experiment th th there was a claim that people um ended up inside the metal and we have already discussed how the metal can be made to um uh, be liquid but not liquid and uh, that if you're non-conducting body you will be able to push into that and then if the field is switched off you're found it part in and out of the material the other effects like I think bruising and whatever those are all things that could occur from uh, intense uh, coherent matter radiation exposure I mean uh, I've already showed you like <laughs> a bullet made of uh, diamond uh, coherent matter waves
you wouldn't want that going into your body yeah wp for truth not only would you not age you would disappear to the observer yes you would disappear you would disappear and you could stay in that structure for a hundred years you could literally be <laughs> in a place for a thousand years and then reappear in that same place a thousand years later and you basically would not have aged at all <laughs> and it's like where did he go <laughs> so that explains your queen maybe uh. Okay, I'm going to see if there's anything down the bottom. Uh, so how would you be able to stop it going into the future? Well, you would energize this structure so that it would fail at a certain point or you would the, the control uh, uh, um, structure that, that drives it would run out of energy at some point. Um, you, you would uh, make it in a... In a a system so it wouldn't self-sustain for an indefinite period of time so like those solitons in Bogdanovich's work persist for let's say two days and um, however they're formed and whatever they're formed from they're only able to persist from two days in our experiments we, we can get like you know the ball lightning is there and then when you turn off the supporting field it disappears and whatever state of coherence the matter got to it, it yields the products coming out of it um so i mean it, as i said a number of years ago to Aarhus university scientists i said like, at some point in the future there will be whole universities with uh, it, many departments and each department would focus on exploring an avenue of what is possible with certain aspects of this technology um and uh, i believe that this was already done in the past and uh, you know the, the 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 trick is is that you are you are manipulating the fabric of the universe and you are able to make and destroy matter and transmute matter and so um as as jesus said uh you know the meek shall inherit the earth and the proper translation of the word meek uh from the greek uh, is uh um effectively the whole phrase becomes those that know that they have great power but choose not to use it will inherit the earth there are great powers within this that we should choose not to use um but we need to recognize that they're there um the, the problem for me in 2017 was i realized that the weapon side of this which are un unimaginably horrendous and of course we now know that from the u.s navy patents where they say with very little effort we can use the high frequency gravitational waves that this system would produce um to destroy the earth and turn it into little particles of dust um so we know that you don't want that to occur so uh it has to be something that humanity needs to recognize and i believe that this has been achieved in the past uh but you know uh i don't know whether there was a great war or whether we destabilized the the magnetic field on the earth or whatever but uh whatever reason i i i think that we've been through a couple of cycles and uh maybe we're coming into the next cycle um where we understand this technology and uh, i hope that we 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 use it to go off planet and um have a look at you know Seeing what's in our neighbourhood, uh, I in our sort of neighbourhood part of our galaxy, as it were. Um, I, I, I honestly, Peter, I think probably the propulsion um, uh, has already been done. I, I, I don't think it's much of a leap. And given the fact that those Russians, if you go to our Facebook page and you look up CIA and you can go and link and you can go and find the link that I'm referring to. Um, and I think I've got the link in my presentation that I gave uh, to the APEC group uh, in that presentation, which I'll publish when I publish the edited video. Um, 
I think they already had a good understanding of this technology. The, the problem I have with this technology is the same problem that anyone would have if they wanted to control their citizens. And, and I've said this before, if you had a technology that allowed you to go to the other side of the planet in two seconds and it cost you nothing in terms of energy and each person could do it individually, how could you control anything on Earth? You would basically, it would just have to be an agreement of everyone to just act civilly. <laughs> <laughs> because everyone could go anywhere instantaneously as far as anyone is concerned so you couldn't stop things being imported you couldn't stop someone popping into your house and 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 popping to the other side of the planet you wouldn't even know that they were there you would have to be able to track everyone and and if they infringed a, a an agreed set of rules you would have to be able to have, switch them off um or or you would you you know you would have to have a society that was much more um uh respectful essentially you would have to have a society that was very very respectful of each other like uh just respectful <laughs> uh so how, uh, so the question is from Thor, how do you know which stable isotopes will beta decay with applied voltage? So go and look at the uh, Leonid Ritzkov presentation from Sochi 2018. Uh, so uh, you can find that on our MR, MR, uh, FMP um, YouTube channel. He, in that presentation, I think it's three or four isotopes of fully stable elements that will immediately fission when they're fully ionized. Uh, these have already been experimentally proven actually over many decades and so um that is that is something that um you you can know happens now the question is is they haven't done these experiments for every isotope in the periodic table and it is because there's three or four already identified it's very likely that there are many others however these are just fully ionizing imagine you have a a, a, a double layer that has 3.6 trillion electron volts charge separation power or it's much higher than that because they're they're self-admitting in this paper here that they, they are admitting that the charge separation uh and magnetic fields and everything is dependent on the parameters in which they use to create the, create the thing i mean they might have deliberately chose this thing to simulate on the computer because it's something they could verify with a with a, a you know an experiment using an actual laser so they could actually verify what they are um calculating here and and know that the calculation is a good uh, representation of the experiment um but it could be that it might, could be much higher charge separation forces uh, uh fields and 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 therefore you could get to the point where uh, you are ripping the electrons out of the neutron, neutron, uh, nucleus. But I've already argued in the first part of this presentation that um, you only need to go over 0.5 of an EV and you will create an electron, uh, sorry, uh, an, uh, a cold neutrino and, uh, and cold antineutrino pair. And when you have those in play, they can stimulate inverse beta decays of the material. So if you have all this neutrinos and all this uh, baryonic matter in an incredibly intense vortex what will happen well the, the matter will you know <laughs> all kinds of reactions will happen in incredibly small time frames and then if this is crushing and crushing and crushing and more and it's getting more and more intense then you will have uh, neutron decay uh, baryonic matter decay and this is what Solin says in his 2012 uh, sorry his 1992 pattern it's what uh, Matsumoto is saying in 1995, 1996, it's what is observed by S.V. Adamenko at the Proton 21 labs with 600 man years of experimentation over that six year period with the equipment that's now at Brookhaven National Laboratory in the US exploring fusion technology. This is in that book that, you know, they are observing decay of, of uh, nucleons. Uh, and so there we go. Um, I believe that there's, uh, the problem is going to be in, m m clairvoyantly, I've said for a number of years, uh, it's going to be between 2030 and 2033, somewhere around there. Um, and I think that we need to get this technology running, recognize it, and... and um, <sighs> 
ensure that the great power is not used. Those that know that they have great power but choose not to use it will inherit the earth. We, we need to recognize that this is possible, um, that it is a real thing, uh, that it works at every scale, just as we've seen those structures at four microns and four millimeters uh, on the Hutchison samples, and they are identical. One is in 1986 and one is in 2007. One is on steel and the other one is on aluminium. There's no way John Hutchison could have faked that. And that this vortical structure... Uh, is the same structure that you will see on that same sample. There are structures that are identical to structures that you see on sunspots that are eight times the diameter of the Earth. This works at every scale, every, every scale. So if you can destroy something at the hand size, you can destroy it. And the, the Navy are saying you can ex destroy things at the planet size. Believe them. Believe they can do that. <laughs> because it will work at any size. <laughs> so believe them. So we need to stop. Uh, we, 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 the world needs to recognize that this amazing power of the gods, literally. People will have set themselves up as gods, probably traveled here using this technology, done party tricks like creating hurricanes and vol triggering volcanoes and earthquakes and cloning things and teleporting and, and pretending to live for very long periods of time. And, well, observably they are. Um, They'll have been able to do all of these things uh, and to, to the normal homo sapien, they would have appeared as gods and they could basically have all the reverence as a god. But it's, it's, uh, it's just using nature. And if anything, nature is God. That is it. Nature is God. It's everything is God. And so uh, they are abusing what nature in order to hold dominion over us. And so we need to we need to have a conversation about this, and, and people need to recognise this. And so it's 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 nice for me to have, you know, it's nice for me to have these guys uh, actually putting some meat onto the bone. It's one thing to say, look, these transmutation is occurring, and you can spend thirty five dollars and go and run the experiment yourself for twenty minutes of uh, uh, of your time, uh, and and people go, well, I don't believe it, and it's like seriously, just go and do it. Um, uh, or the experiments that Matsumoto is in, the actual details of the experiment that he last did is in the section that I've just released of his book. Uh, the diagram's on the second to last page, 90 or 89. And it's very simple. It's, it's, it's an electrode of uh, one millimeter of lead with a, a counter electrode, I think of copper or, or whatever, in a, you know, a jar with uh, some uh, potassium hydroxide, uh, 1.5 molar solution. And uh, he's using, uh, I think, 120 volts or 200 and something volts um, AC, and it's 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 a few milliseconds really, and job done. You're you're converting to lead into carbon, lead into carbon. That that is uh, nuclear rebirth. This is the technology we will be able to terraform planets that are not suitable for human existence. This is maybe maybe Earth wasn't good when when the first. Uh, uh, people came here, they go, well, it's the right part of the solar system, but, you know, it needs a bit of work to get it up to spec. So they, they did something. <laughs> ah, well, Civilian Space Agency. AI is not very good with this technology. This technology is our greatest defense against a world <laughs> based on AI. <laughs> because AI re requires uh, uh, um, the type of technology that we've been building based on uh, silicon semiconductors. And it, it needs um, Josephs and Junctions. It needs this. It needs tunneling in, in semiconductors and, and, and so forth. And this technology completely messes with that. In fact, in many respects, the difficulty with rolling out the technology to produce propulsion and energy is that the fields around these devices will prevent uh, and not the technology that I'm broadcasting this on with you right now from working. And as I've said, uh, this was intimated to me about the Padamoshwami Temple vaults, 
where the no electronic equipment would work in those vaults, which were storing vast quantities of gold and uh, other precious metals and gems, all of these things that you would need to uh, do this technology. Um, it had a metal band around the room, and it wasn't until they cut the band that, that their equipment worked. And this is the same that George Eagley told me when he was visiting these... Um, uh, spoon benders in Israel that his equipment would not work when it was near to the um, uh, the people doing the spoon bending and so uh, this technology creates uh, um, a, a, an area around it where normal kind of things that we we do don't work and uh, I you know if I had a generator using this technology I wouldn't want to be um, within probably Within probably about two to three meters of it, I, I um, the the torsion fields and and the the lack of relic neutrino flux and so on. I don't think that it just wouldn't be good for for uh, human, uh, but just but biology in general, it just wouldn't be good. <laughs> so I, you know, I don't mind burying it sort of, I don't know, five ten meters underground, and that provides all the energy. That would be fine, um, or have it in an offset. It depends on the the level of cohering forces um, and whether you're traveling through. Like if you had it in a, in a car, that would be less of a problem because uh, it would be cohering matter. But I wouldn't want a car park full of these things and walk through the car park. So you, you might want an electric uh, cars to be charged with this technology that is generating the power elsewhere. Um, you might want a, a sort of drivetrain that runs like that. And people need to recognize that this this not only messes with electronics, it messes with biology, but it messes with biology less bad, badly, less less damaging. Like it, it, it stops electronics from working and blows them up. Uh, whereas um, I, I described this in the past, I think that for a consciousness uh, vessel, using the elements that are in our body are the most desirable to use. Uh, you know, so um, if you start introducing metals, semiconductors, <clears throat> and combinations thereof, then <clears throat> anything trying to carry uh, anything sort of sentient is going to be able to be easily destroyed or vanquished with this technology. So the revolution will not be televised. Yes, probably that's the case. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Fox Badger, I'm doing my laundry while listening to this presentation. Can you kids keep it down in there? <laughs> I love it. <laughs> The big tech would hate this tech. Yeah, absolutely. They will not want this technology out because it gives you the freedom to go everywhere. It gives them no ability to track you because, you know, you, you know, a coherent matter shield will prevent any photon going through. And what are the photons that they would want to get through? They would want to get microwaves through, which are photons. <laughs> they wouldn't be able to get through. So they couldn't track you. You would literally disappear. So, like, you can't. There's disappearing from visible light, but there's also disappearing from electromagnetic waves that are able to track you. You would completely go off grid. You would literally disappear. So um, in October 2016, I was sent an email by a person who I'd communicated with a lot, um, who had been trying to track the project since the, its early days in 2012. And uh, he worked at the US Naval Labs. And the last email he sent me was, uh, on I think it was around about uh, the second week in October 2016. And he said... Um, Bob, I think the only way this technology is going to get into um, um, into the world is through uh, an open project, something like what you're doing, and it and that was the most weird thing. That was that was basically his sign-off email in terms of communication, 
And uh, that, that was before I um, got anywhere close to where things are now. And, uh, you know, <laughs> you, you have military guys phoning you up and say, look, don't, we're, we're all discussing you at the conferences, but don't, don't worry. No one, no one wants to kill you yet. Just, just keep on doing what you're doing. It's like, okay, that's reassuring. <laughs> and, but now you're seeing the, this paper, this, this paper here, um, you know, is, is, it's, it's a nice thing to see that so many international bodies and uh, top level financing is is going into this collaboration to find out what we've been bleeding on about for years <laughs> but you know they they're thinking about it in a way over complicated way uh, um yeah the ancients had to be able to do this with rudimentary technology right no elaborate control systems they're just getting in tune with it they're just they're, they're working with nature they look at what nature is telling them that it does and then they are working with nature okay so um I, I want to talk. Uh, I'm, I'm going to be presenting to the Russian community on uh, Wednesday. Uh, I'm going to be extending um, the uh, presentation that I gave at Azizi on um, uh, a Mars gas Lena in a can. Um, I, in that presentation, I will be expanding upon one particular image in correlation with things that I shared in the APEC presentation. And uh, for me, this particular observation shows that these magnetic vortices are able to rip matter apart. It has a directional beam that comes out of the back, which can tear matter apart. But, you know, uh, I think it's it's relieving something that's pressure. <laughs> it's like relieving pressure and the matter just falls apart. The matter runs on the uh, incident flux of this pressure but when the pressure is removed and it's and it then it creates a real vacuum um the matter wants to fill that void it just falls apart and i think to a certain extent that's what's happening with john hutchison's technology that and the fact that the structures themselves create magnetic structures which then want to interact with each other and i've explained how different metals depending on their paramagnetic state diamagnetic state or or ferromagnetic state will uh, um, fracture or jellyfy or whatever in, in different ways um, but underlying it all underlying all of these technologies is this same same uh, principle and it's really very very simple so uh, thank you very very much um, for uh, spending this time with me today I encourage you all to go and look at this paper um, I will add the links uh, that I have to this paper, to the um, blog at remoteview.icu. I encourage everyone to have a um, look, uh, sorry, ask any questions on remoteview.icu so I can have some persistence with the answers and the answers I can give one to many, uh, which is always my preferred mode. But in summary today, what we looked at is, um, we looked at, uh, the structure of the exotic vacuum object and the fact that it has a history uh, um, it would turn out well we, 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 it was derived from John Hutchison's structure here we have uh, first off we have the outy and the inny the yin and the yang in these magnetic soliton uh, structures and that they uh, can cluster together as Ken Shoulders says in this multiple toroidal form and uh, it's fractal and they get bigger and bigger and uh, they have various influence on material that it was first observed by Winston Bostick in the 1950s and this is published in the 70s I think in the tail end of their work and that has this typically this d4d ratio uh, 
and uh, that, uh, according to Bostick's uh, uh, proclamations in 1957, it could uh, be the basis for everything that we observe in the visible universe at every scale, and it's just a sort of fractal growth of the same structures all the way down to subatomic particles um, and so forth, and that uh, this structure, in my view, is my best guess at it at the moment, that uh, the... Uh, by the way, in this paper, John Archibald Wheeler invents the term black hole and invents the term wormhole and has a picture of a wormhole. Um, and so I think he was well on to the money um, and I can't imagine a more uh, brilliant person. And uh, I, I believe it does have this gra gravitational uh, moment through it. And that if you can imagine this gravitational moment and it forms into a crystal-like structure like this, like this, and a mesh-like structure that covers over something uh, in the way that is effectively uh, presented uh, in the ancient technology, both on the Temple of Osiris here and this copy of an Indian, Indian temple dragon uh, ball that is under the food, dra food dragon in the middle palace in the Forbidden Palace in Beijing. Um, that, that if you can imagine that this is uh, uh, producing these gravi gravitational sort of effects, and when I say gravitational, it's rejecting the influence of the thing that. Uh, 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 endows matter with mass and inertia and so it protects the thing inside there but I, I think it will also cause uh, time and um, uh, time and uh, consciousness problems and that is needs to be something that we are concerned with and that in this paper they used a, a uh, they tried to simulate intense laser pulses into plasma with a gradient in the plasma density and uh, they produced a toroidal vortex uh, in the case of a 2D plane. They get a, a, a north and south effective monopole structures forming essentially as was observed in the 1950s by uh, Winston Bostick and by others since. Uh, and that these, this produces a flux tube like uh, prominences on the sun and that if you put this into the 3D plane they're oh so surprised that it comes out at a structure that looks like a Ra and uh, that this uh, has relativistic speeds and intense magnetic fields far greater than has been achieved by any other technological uh, process created by man thus far. Therefore working with nature is the way to do the most amazing things that nature can possibly achieve and they even refer into this the fact that learning from this will help us to be able to understand and uh, deal with tornadoes so um uh, there we go so thank you very very much for um the uh time uh, that you shared with me here and i would uh uh, hope to see you uh, I might be if I publish the video tomorrow I will be available for chat during that video uh, and like I say I think there's some really interesting things in the APEC video and then um, I will publish the Russian one later in the week and I'll be available for chat on that and I have to focus at the tail end of the week on um, rolling out the Kickstarter for the Vega Valley images and uh, there we go so um that's it. So thank you very much for your time. Buenas noches. Uh, Dobre uh, uh I will see you uh, when I see you. Thank you very much. Bye.